Good afternoon, everybody from Paris, and welcome to this uh, OECD workshop on environmental policy, social and economic outcomes that we are organizing together with uh, the European Union. Uh, we have uh, a great agenda with uh, leading experts uh, dealing with the empirical evidence on this topic. And, and we'll be doing a deeper dive into uh, the three key sets of issues, uh, starting with innovation and firm productivity, then going to employment and labor market implications, and finally uh, concluding uh, the workshop with a focus on social and distribution issues. Um, just one housekeeping announcement. Uh, by this time, I assume all of you are experts at Zoom, but um, just in case, in case uh, you have questions uh, to pose to any of the speakers, uh, please use uh, the Q&A function at the, uh, at the bottom middle of your screen. And the moderators of the various sessions will try and pick a couple of questions uh, to pose uh, to the panelists if there is time. Uh, but otherwise, we encourage all speakers uh, to engage with the audience through the Q&A session, even after the session has been completed. So with that brief housekeeping announcement, it's my great pleasure to first uh, welcome uh, Alain Dasser, who's the acting director of the Environment Directorate and Stephen White uh, from the European Commission, who is also the chair of OECD's Working Party on Integrating Environment and Economic Policies, uh, which has been doing a lot of work in this area. So let me invite Alain to give his remarks, followed by Stephen. Thank you, Shardul, and good day to all. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this workshop on the interaction between environmental policies and social and economic outcomes. Uh, this event is taking place at a time when policymakers are under increasing pressure to ensure both an inclusive economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic and accelerated action on climate and the environment. The days when environment and climate change uh, were niche issues only of concerns to ministries of environment are long gone. Instead, they have moved front and center on the agendas of most ministries, including economy and finance, health and transport, just to name a few. This shift in focus on environmental challenges in part reflects enhanced understanding of the risk. Continued advances in the scientific understanding of the underlying processes, as well as efforts to synthesize that knowledge have both contributed to broader public awareness of the risk and in turn calls for action, and this is good news. Of course, it is unfortunate that the interest in these issues has also emerged from the increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, as well as the devastating impacts of our mismanagement of the natural resources on the environment, people, and livelihoods. So governments are under new, are, are now under pressure to scale up and accelerate their ambition on climate and the environment. But in taking such action forward, they are having to carefully navigate a number of headwinds. These include the long-term impacts of the COVID pandemic still uh, on, the, on the impact pandemic on both the economy and society. At the start of the year, uh, the, world, the world economy was still on track for a fairly strong albeit uneven recovery from COVID-19. This change with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which remains first and foremost a humanitarian disaster. So globally, the war, as well as the continued uh, pressures from the, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, from, the, from the COVID pandemic have had huge impacts uh, on cost of living due both to the slower economic growth and inflation rates not seen since the 1970s. Low-income people and the poorest economies are hardest hit, primarily due to steep increases in the price of energy and food. It is in this wider macroeconomic context that this workshop takes particular significance. More than ever, regulators are in need of tools and insights to assess the consequences of policies on the environment, the economy, and the social outcomes. This exchange among researchers and policymakers is therefore very timely. The discussions will also provide extremely 
helpful input to our OECD-wide project on climate and economic uh, resilience. So against this background, I'm really delighted to see such an excellent lineup of speakers at this workshop who will be sharing insights from their empirical and model research, as well as policy perspective perspectives. It is also great to see a number of OECD directorates represented as countries are taking a more mainstream approach to the environment and climate in their domestic and international policy discussions, it is natural to see this being mirrored in our work at the OECD. So through, our, through horizontal initiatives, we can better leverage our wide reach and multidisciplinary expertise to provide policy advice that supports whole of government approaches needed to effectively tackle the complex environmental challenges that the world is up against. A key example is our horizontal project on climate and economic resilience, which draws on contributions from right across the house and for which this work, workshop is very relevant and no doubt will be very useful. So before I conclude, let me thank the European Commission for the support to our work on examining the implications of environmental policies on social and economic outcomes. And with that, I wish you a very fruitful discussions and look forward to continue this engagement as we support countries in navigating the course towards inclusive economic development and a healthy environment. So thank you. And now let me pass the, the floor to uh, Stephen from the commission. Stephen. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you. Uh, this is a, a really interesting area. I think when the work started, it was pertinent and it's more, more pertinent now than it was then. Um, the sensitivity to jobs is increasing. Uh, we've long talked about the links between environment and employment. We've never fully understood what the message is, I think. Uh, we've been inconsistent sometimes in how we've passed it. And I think politically, if you see someone who is setting a law and a firm, for example, approaches them and says, well, if you do this, we will cut jobs. That is a really powerful message which we are seeing passed sometimes in the discussions and how policies work. And I think the analytical answers we have to that are not always good. We say this is a short term thing, and yet sometimes we can see, for example, in coal areas that the, the changes of 20, 30, 40 years ago are still visible. So we need to have a much better understanding of what the transition means in terms of employment, uh, how we understand it so that we can manage it and improve the situation. Then we've got the issue of distributional factors, uh, which has become much more relevant with the cost of living crisis. Uh, it's always been relevant, it's always been an issue, but I think it's the visibility of it has moved up the agenda considerably. Uh, we can easily see political blockages happening because we don't understand distributional factors. So it's important that we understand that and we prove, improve the way in which we're looking at it. Otherwise, we can't, for example, have uh, the polluter pays principle fully applied because discussions on taxes will get sidelined and analytical discussions where we don't have an answer. But we, at the same time, we need to understand how the tr transition is working. And it's not just one change, but it's also looking at the current situation. For example, with biodiversity, what's the situation just now? Is the distributional access to it the same? So two areas, employment distributional factors, which link up with for a long time in the European Commission had a commitment to integrated analysis of economic, social and environmental factors. We've improved our practice, but I still don't think we have answers to many of those analytical questions. So we don't see consistent answers. Sometimes we jump to the long term and we miss the short term, which is politically quite relevant. And it means that we actually miss out on some of the mitigation measures which we could put in place to make things sure that the transition takes place more smoothly. So it's with uh, great interest to listen to some of the discussions in this workshop. I think they're highly policy relevant. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Anna and uh, Stephen. And with that, we now move to the first uh, substantive session. 
uh, which uh, is, is taking an overview of the empirical evidence on uh, the implications of environmental policies. And uh, we have uh, an excellent cast of speakers. Uh, we have uh, Professor Anna Alberini from the University of Maryland, uh, Antoine de Chilipret from the OECD, and uh, we have Carolyn Fisher uh, from the World Bank, uh, who will be uh, the discussant uh, in this session. Uh, in terms of sequence of the speakers, we have changed it slightly. We'll kick it off with Antoine providing an overview of insights uh, from the work that the OECD has done over the past several years in this area, followed by Anna, who will be taking a deeper dive into uh, two areas, uh, transportation and energy efficiency. And, and then uh, Carolyn will be providing her discussing remarks. If there is time, I'll try to pose a question or two uh, to, uh, to the panel. Uh, each of the speakers will have 10 minutes. So with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Antoine de Chilipret, who's currently a senior economist at, uh, in the Science, Technology and Innovation uh, Directorate of the OECD, and was previously in uh, the Environment Directorate and the Economics Department, where he led some of the work that he's presenting. Uh, and prior to coming to the OECD, he was at the London School of Economics. Uh, Antoine's research deals with the role of innovation and technology diffusion, for the green transition and the role of public policies in encouraging the development and adoption of clean technologies. Uh, he's the winner of the 2020 European Award for Researchers in Environmental Economics under the age of 40. So with that, Antoine, you have the floor. Thanks, Shandu. Thanks a lot for the game work. Um, so let me share my screen. Uh, who, who can share? Um, Okay, sorry, there was a weird pop up thing, but I think I'm there. So um, I'm very happy to be here uh, and present all this work that, that we've been uh, conducting in the Environment Directorate for, for many years. Uh, before me, after me, there's a long uh, list of work that I'm very happy to uh, report on today on the economic impacts of uh, environmental policies. The, um, so just to say that this is uh, me presenting today, but it's uh, really work that was uh, done by uh, a large group of uh, people in, in, in the directorate um, over the, the years. So the, the background for all this, this work that we did um, is, is, is quite straightforward. We observe um, a, a large increase over time uh, in, in environmental policy stringency. And, and we've been following this uh, quite closely with our indicator of environmental policy stringency, which we very recently updated until uh, 2020. And, and you can see here that, especially uh, between the years 2000 and 2010, there's been a slowdown in this growth uh, more recently, but at least in that decade, uh, the, the average stringency of environmental policy across uh, OECD countries and, and emerging economies uh, has tripled. So there was this uh, you know, large increase in this uh, ambition of uh, environmental policies, I should say mostly climate and air pollution policies, which are the ones that we uh, focus on in this indicator. Um, and, and of course, that uh, increase in, in, in ambition and stringency um, led to you know, many questions that uh, both Alain uh, and, and Stephen uh, just, just mentioned about the impact that these uh, might have on uh, economic performance of firms, on jobs, and, and, and other uh, dimensions. But I think um, the, the main reason for that, that worry um, is actually not so much the overall increase in, in environmental policy stringency, although, of course, you know, firms are differently affected by these uh, policies, but it's mostly uh, due to the fact that, in fact, environmental policy stringency has evolved at a different pace across countries. And that you can see very clearly from this graph. Um, the bar of the uh, EPS index in 2020, you can see a lot of heterogeneity already. But if you look at uh, the black dots or the gray dots, uh, which are down here and, and show the value in 2000, you can see that uh, there's a large difference in terms of how fast uh, countries have uh, moved. And, and, and so, of course, that uh, brings the, the, the question of the potential you know, impact that these 
diverging trends in, in climate policy um, implementation could have on, on competitiveness of uh, domestic, domestic firms. And, and of course, with the Paris Agreement that kind of you know, enshrines this, this divergence, this uh, could, could even uh, get even larger in, uh, in the next future. So what we's, uh, we've been doing is, is looking uh, very carefully at, at the impact that these uh, differences in, in environmental policies tendency across countries and, and across time uh, have had on uh, various economic dimensions, employment, productivity, trade, investment, and, and other measures of firm performance like uh, output. Um, and actually many of those um, papers that you can see here, uh, they, they were um, done as part of this project that uh, the, the European Commission generously uh, funded. So thank you, Steve. So let me summarize uh, what we found. The, the first uh, result, which really um, comes out very clearly from basically all of this work, is uh, the very small uh, aggregate effects of environmental policies on all these various measures of uh, economic performance or, or outcomes. Here I'm just showing two examples. On the left-hand side is trade. On the right-hand side is, is, is FDI. But what I want you to focus on here is, is just uh, on, on this uh, very small uh, difference that you know, we attribute to changes in environmental policy stringency over time. So on the left-hand side, for example, this you know, increased stringency over uh, 15 years also really explains a, a small share of, of uh, the variation in, 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 in trade. Um, and, and of course, uh, there are some differences across uh, the type of sectors or products that, that we look at. So that's the first uh, result, small effects on, on aggregate. But uh, the, second, the second result is, of course, the heterogeneity. So basically what we observe is, um, and that is not very surprising, is um, winners and, and losers. So again, I'm just showing two examples here, but you know, across the many uh, outcomes that we looked at over the years, be it you know, employment, productivity, but also trade, you saw with this pollution intensity, um, what we see is basically some sectors uh, win and some others um, lose out, some firms win, some, some others uh, lose. The high productivity firm, for example, on the right hand, -hand side, they, they managed to um, actually perform better, they increase their productivity following an increase in environmental policy stringency, but the low productivity firms, the, the lag up firms, they, they lose out. And so what we observe is these small aggregate um, impacts but that hide a lot of opportunity both across firms and uh, across sectors. With, of course, the high energy intensive um, high pollution intensive, low productivity firms uh, getting, getting hit. Um, we observe that, as I said, across you know, many uh, dimensions, this is you know, trade and, and investment. And, and here again, we see differences uh, according to, for example, the uh, pollution intensity of uh, the sectors with the, you know, on the, on the left-hand side in trade, the high pollution, um, sectors uh, losing out, but the low pollution sectors, which become you know, more competitive in this new low carbon economy, uh, gain. So that's the summary of what we find. Um, very modest aggregate uh, effects on the economy, and especially, and I think that's an important point, especially when we compare this with, with other you know, structural uh, factors, other you know, major changes that are currently affecting the, the economy. Uh, for example, if you take employment, we, we show that the um, change in environmental policy stringency explains you know, one between one and three percent of the total change in manufacturing employment over the last 20 years. But in comparison, if you look at labor markets, say in the US, you know, 40 percent of people change jobs each year. Um, there's, you know, 25% of jobs that uh, people say or researchers say are at risk of being automated, you know, compared to these major trends, uh, environmental policies don't matter that much. But as I say, these small effects, they hide these heterogeneous effect with, you know, some firms losing, some firms um, winning, some firms exiting that, you know, frees up market share that the more, 
you know, energy um, efficient firms can, can take um, and, and, and so on. And finally, this negative effect, we typically find them uh, in the short run, but they dissipate uh, over the, the long run. Now, one question uh, before I, I conclude. One question that immediately comes to mind is, well, these you know, um, environmental policies have not been so uh, stringent overall. So perhaps the fact that we observe these, these small effects um, in aggregate is just a reflection of the fact that they are having uh, very small effects everywhere, including on, on emissions, for example, which is the, the primary uh, reason for why they are being introduced. And, and, on, and that's why we look at um, the, the, the impact that these policies have on, on emissions at the same time. And, and, and we absolutely don't find uh, that they're having no effect on this as well, uh, actually quite the opposite. So this is one example from the European uh, carbon market, which we looked at in, in one of these papers. And you see clearly this, <clears throat> and I don't have time to go into detail of the methodology, but we look at the causal effect of this, uh, of this policy by, by look, you know, comparing these firms in the UETS with very similar firms that are not uh, regulated because they are under some uh, thresholds. And, and you can see clearly this massive decrease, um, very impressive in, in terms of the carbon emission that these firms generate when they start facing a price on their emissions, but we see no impact on, on, on jobs. Um, and, and similarly, uh, Damien Dussault, who is speaking in the next session, did a study on the impact of the French carbon tax, show, uh, finding again the exact same uh, result. Uh, the red line here shows the reduction in emissions, and the, the purple line uh, up there shows uh, no effect on, uh, on, on jobs. Again, in aggregate, we do find some uh, differential effects across sectors and, and firms. So, looking ahead. Um, as I said, you know, policies have not been uh, extremely stringent so far, but now we have these uh, much more ambitious targets, and in particular, these uh, net zero targets for 2050, which, you know, 80% of the world economy have now uh, announced, and that requires, uh, in the very near future, to take, if we're serious about these targets, to take uh, much more ambitious uh, action. And that came out very clearly from the, the IPCC report on mitigation, which came out uh, recently. The trend for implemented policy, which is this red line up there, you know, shows uh, not much um, increased effort, but you know, if we want to reach uh, 2050 net zero, then we need to be uh, much more, much more ambitious. And, and so the, the, then the question is, um, you know, are the results that we found in this uh, whole empirical literature, I'm showing the OECD work, but there's, you know, much more out there that will be presented at the workshop. Um, the question is, will these results uh, hold with much more uh, stringent policies, you know? Um, in particular, there were all these, you know, compensation mechanisms, uh, free allocations, for example, in, in carbon markets, um, cost compensation mechanisms for energy taxes. So, you know, if, if we get rid of those and then we become much more stringent, will the results, uh, and, and then the policy question uh, coming, um, following on for, from this is, uh, you know, when the, the threat of these, you know, competitiveness effects become, becomes real, because, you know, theory would tell you they, they have to become real at, at some point if the divergence increases, uh, too much, then, then what's the, the good response, you know? So the European Union is looking into uh, border carbon adjustment mechanisms. Of course, many uh, alternatives or you know, other measures uh, that are complementary to this would include uh, actually supporting innovation, for example, in clean technology. Um, but, you know, understanding the, these, these patterns of, you know, who wins, who loses, and incorporating this into policy design, as was already mentioned in the uh, introductory talks, uh, is, is going to be increasingly important going forward. So, Chardul, back to you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Antoine, for this uh, very interesting overview of, uh, of the key findings from our work. Um, as time is tight, I'm going to go straight uh, to uh, Anna now. Uh, so uh, Professor Anna Alberini is an environmental economist at the University of Maryland. Her research focuses on residential energy demand and energy efficiency decisions and on vehicle fuel economy and driving decisions 
She's a member of the editorial board of the Energy Journal, the International Advisory Board of Energy Policy, and an associate editor of Energy Efficiency. Uh, she's also the chair of the American Statistical Association's Advisory Committee to the U.S. Uh, Energy Information Administration. So uh, without further ado, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you for the introduction. So let me make sure that I share my screen and you guys just give me one second to get organized. Can you see my screen okay? I'm gonna put it in- Yes, uh, you see mode. Thank you. So, uh, well, good morning, everyone. If you are in the United States, good afternoon if you are in Europe and good evening if you are in Asia. Um, I think I covered pretty much the entire globe. My name is Anna Alberini. I'm at the University of Maryland, but today I'm teleworking from home, from Washington, DC. So uh, my job here is to remind you about consumers. And so for that reason, I've chosen a couple of topics that are important to me and to my research, and I hope um, will be of interest to you. So we'll be talking about the transportation sector and uh, something that is really a measure of performance or a concept, but not a sector, and that would be energy efficiency, because uh, consumers are big constituents of these two things, so transportation and energy efficiency uh, type of issues. So transportation uh, is an essential sector of the economy, as we learned during the pandemic. And if we didn't know that already before, we move people, we move goods. Uh, it's extremely important that things are working well in the transportation sector. But of course, the transportation sector uh, is also responsible for a lot of negative externalities. So we have tailpipe emissions from vehicles, from cars, from trucks. We have non-tailpipe emissions. And so think about the uh, erosion, the abrasion of the tires and all of the pollutants that this, is, this releases into the environment, something that there is, has been a lot of recent attention uh, dedicated to. Um, think about the indirect emissions. If you have an electric vehicle, um, you're gonna be using electricity. Maybe the electricity is generated, uh, creating a lot of emissions, but also traffic congestions, accidents, road wear and tear, noise, all sorts of stuff. The transportation sector, as we have learned in the last few months, is also very vulnerable to energy security issues. Energy efficiency is really not a sector. It's really more a measure of performance or a concept. And it covers the variety of industries, including, of course, industries and sectors, including, of course, the transportation sector, but also the residential sector. And so that's why consumers are very well represented in both uh, transportation as well as in the residential sector um, as uh, people that take advantage of um, energy efficiency. Energy efficiency actually has been always very important to economists, to engineers, to a lot of people, but it really became super important uh, when the McKinsey uh, report was published in 2009, which emphasized that actually energy efficiency is what allows you to get CO2 emissions reduction at low or even negative cost. Uh, and needless to say, energy efficiency is also very important uh, in helping with energy security, which is an issue that is especially um, important to these days. So something that um, you could probably already see a little bit in the slides that Antoine was showing is that uh, emissions, CO2 emissions in particular, have been coming down in the power sector uh, quite a bit, you know, courtesy in Europe, for example, of the uh, emission trading system. But the transportation sector really doesn't do very well. So the transportation sector, the emissions from the transportation sector are uh, represented by the blue line here. And as you can see, the trend really isn't towards a reduction at all over time. This is for Europe, and these data are coming from the European Environment Agency, but it turns out that actually in the US, you have a very similar situation. So here the uh, emissions from the CO2 emissions from transportation are in red. So you can see that they're not really coming down at all. The ones that are coming down are the one from the power generation uh, sector. And I don't know how well you can see the emissions from the residential sector. They're the, one in this, the ones in this color, which I would describe as chartreuse maybe, uh, but they're certainly not coming down. And uh, the reason is that people are buying more and more equipment, houses are bigger. Even if uh, equipment is more energy efficient, energy efficient, really there isn't a whole bunch of reduction reductions in the emissions from the residential sector. So what do the transportation sector and the notion or uh, measure of performance of energy efficiency have in common? Well, um, as you can imagine, we have a small number of equipment producers. So in the transportation sector, we have the automakers, we have the industry that supplies and makes parts uh, for cars and trucks and all this kind of stuff. In other um, sectors of the economy, we can think about the manufacturers of um, air conditioning, for example. This is the summer, so air conditioning is something that we use every day. But there is a large number of equipment users. So think about all of the people, including ourselves, who are driving cars, 
Uh, think about all the people that are running the AC right now at home, that includes myself or at work. So a very large number of equipment users. Now, economists are always recommending that when we're trying to correct environmental externalities, we try to resort as much as possible to uh, market uh, type of tools. But as you can imagine, when you have a situation of this kind, it would be very difficult to get this large number of users to be engaged in emissions trading, for example. So the practice has been that uh, emissions trading is usually allowed to manufacturers, you know, to power stations and all this kind of stuff. There's also a lot of regulation that is imposed on the manufacturers of equipment, of manufacturers of cars, the manufacturers of air conditioning. Um, safety regulations are also uh, imposed on them. For the consumers, uh, if you're interested in um, market or economic type of incentives, we have the options of taxes. So taxes can be imposed on the fuels, taxes can be imposed on the product. So you can have registration taxes, for example, that are linked to the emissions rate of a car. You can have annual circulation taxes that do the same. You can have bonuses and maluses, which have been very popular in several European countries, including France, to encourage people to buy cars that are less environmentally offensive. You can also offer them subsidies to do so. Um, and you can offer subsidies on heat pumps as well as on electric vehicle and plug-in hybrids. So the general notion is that with regulations imposed on the manufacturers will trigger or will require innovation. And um, Antoine and many of the people that collaborated in this OECD project will spend a lot of time discussing that. The general consensus or the assumption that even uh, government um, type of models make is that the regulations will actually raise the cost of equipment to the consumers. And I will let you guys in this particular research project to answer the question whether that's really true in the short run, in the medium run, and in the long run. On, the, on our part, we assume that consumers are sensitive to the price of the energy using durable, to the price of the energy input, to the energy efficiency itself, and of course, to other attributes of the uh, equipment, of the cars, of the AC and so forth. Um, let's take a quick look at whether this is really true uh, issue by issue. So, and remember we're talking about consumers. So first of all, are the consumers sensitive to the price of the energy using durables? So to the price of cars or to the price of AC uh, units or systems that they put in their house? Absolutely. And if you don't believe me, you can talk to the automakers, you can talk to your car dealer, uh, they will confirm this notion. So because of this, uh, it would be interesting, it has been interesting and it has been uh, actually applied in real life to actually impose policy that will work on changing the price that effectively uh, the consumer is paying. So we're talking about rebates or bonuses on the purchase of certain type of vehicles. Regis again, registration taxes that are linked to the emissions rate of the vehicle, annual circulation taxes that are linked to the uh, emissions rate of the vehicle. And so here the question is, um, do these policies actually work? So um, whether they work or not depends on a lot of things. So if you're getting uh, a rebate now, for example, the moment that you're buying the car, that's probably more effective than getting a rebate in the form of a tax credit which you're going to be um, taking care of when you're filing your taxes, probably several months from now, when you've already forgotten about the purchase of the car. If uh, the uh, taxes that you have to pay when you first register your car are very substantial, then changing them through, uh, through a change in the, uh, in the taxes itself is probably very effective. Um, whereas in my own research, I found, for example, that linking things uh, to circulation taxes isn't particularly effective or cost-effective. In fact, um, when you're looking at uh, taxes that you're, you're imposing on the registration of the car, uh, the public, the consumers can be so sensitive that they actually trigger some unintended adverse effects. So uh, there's a very nice paper by Robin Sitsung that finds out that, that when in Finland, they actually linked the registration tax on your car, which is pretty substantial. It accounts for a very large proportion of the price of the car to uh, the CO2 emissions of the car. A lot of uh, car buyers actually switch to diesel and that's great for CO2 emissions reduction, but not for other type of pollutants. Uh, there's a sequence of very nice paper by um, Doug Fouy and other authors that are showing that the French bonus system actually may have triggered the sale and the purchase of many cars, which uh, in turn can actually result in compromising the environmental goals uh, that you had. And there's all sorts of evidence about the possibility of new source bias. Um, are consumers sensitive to the price of the energy input? So the price of gasoline or the price of electricity? Let's think about the price of gasoline, for example. Consumers are definitely very aware of the price of gasoline. They may not be particularly aware of the fact that the 
price at the pump is really the sum of the pre-tax price and the tax that gets applied to the, to the fuel itself. But that's okay, as long as they perceive the entire thing. Uh, it turns out, however, that actually it, it, it seems there's growing evidence that consumers are more sensitive to the tax component of the price of the pump that they pay rather than to the pre-tax price, which depends primarily on the fluctuations of the price of oil in, on the uh, world uh, oil market. So um, lots of issues here, whether you know, these two components are salient, so what part of uh, the, the, you know, the price of the gasoline people are paying attention to. It's unclear whether uh, when uh, gasoline is more uh, expensive, people are actually turning to buying a more fuel efficient car. There's all sorts of evidence pointing in that direction, but also pointing uh, in the opposite direction. But one important question is, are consumers just as sensitive when it comes to electricity and natural gas, which they use at home? Um, I would like to point out the difference between buying gasoline at the pump and um, using electricity at home. You're buying uh, gasoline at the pump and paying right away. Uh, with electricity, you consume first and you pay later. So you don't have a very good sense of the quantity consumed. And in very many cases, you actually don't even have a good sense of the price you're paying, especially if you have a complicated tariff scheme. But when the signal is sufficiently strong, people do respond to changes in the price of electricity and natural gas. I'm gonna show you just quickly a uh, graph based on data that we collected from the Republic of Georgia, where they have a very, very complicated uh, increasing uh, block rate system, which penalizes you as soon as you start consuming more than a certain threshold. The thresholds are 101 and 301 kilowatt hours per month. And you can see that the consumers are really bunching just under the 101. Uh, you can see it here, uh, they, they have a very uh, interesting spike here in the distribution at uh, 101. Um, then, in, um, as soon as the pandemic started, the government actually decided to let the consumers essentially get electricity for free, as long as they're consuming less than 200 kilowatt hours a month. Uh, they started this in 2020, and then they repeated it uh, at the end of 2020 and at the beginning of 2021. Well, guess what? As soon as this announcement was made, you can see quite clearly that there is a gigantic spike uh, at exactly 200, as consumers are really trying to qualify for the level of consumption that lets them get electricity at price zero. So that's an interesting type of thing. Uh, that doesn't always apply, so apply however. Um, this is a histogram that is taken from Kuchiro Ito, uh, based in, on Southern California, that shows that despite uh, the complex pricing scheme that they had, the consumers were virtually paying no attention to it because the distribution of consumption is really, really smooth. In general, we think that despite the different level of attention that the consumers are paying to the price of the energy inputs, the price elasticity of demand uh, tends to be fairly low. And we have several examples from transportation where the demand is represented in vehicle miles traveled or kilometers traveled or um, residential electricity and natural gas. And here the question is whether a low price elasticity is necessarily bad. It's bad if you're really counting on the uh, price uh, of the inputs, so on the price of electricity or gasoline, uh, for people to reduce their consumption so that in that way you're also reducing emissions. It's also bad if you are, um, uh, you know, if you're, it's not so bad if you're concerned about issues of welfare. Uh, but a low price elasticity also means that there's little rebound effect. It also means that you can potentially play with allowing poor people, people at the bottom of the distribution of income to enjoy lower tariffs while uh, covering uh, the cost of supplying electricity to these people by applying higher rates, higher tariffs to the rich. Um, they also, it's also encouraging because with low price elasticity, that means energy assistance uh, or price subsidies really don't have that much effect on consumption. Um, fuel economy or energy efficiency per se is also an interesting issue that we've been looking at forever. There's decades of research on this. And economists are always trying to find out if consumers, when they buy these energy uh, using durables, are really uh, capitalizing, are really looking at the fuel economy. So are prepared to pay more now for saving $1 or 1 euro of uh, fuel or energy cost in the future. The um, evidence on this is very, very inconclusive and it's so fragile in the sense that it really depends on the assumptions that you're making on discount rates, on the time uh, that the um, car will be uh, in use and all this kind of stuff. 
Um, of course, you know, we can forget that consumers don't just look at the fuel economy or the content of um, CO2 uh, per unit of distance uh, in their car. They also look at a variety of other things. With electric vehicles, range is very important. Availability of charging station is very important. Conspicuous conservation, like you want to buy an electric vehicle just because, is also a potentially important component of the reason why people are buying certain type of cars, but also comfort, safety, prestige. Uh, all of these things are very important. In my opinion, we've also forgotten quite a bit when people are making um, energy efficiency decisions in the residential context. We're also forgetting that a lot of these energy efficiency upgrades that you could be making to your home really have costs that economists don't take into account. There's going to be disruption in your house. There's going to be a lot of dust and noise. You're going to have workers. You may have to move out while the construction is ongoing. And that's in itself could be one of the reasons why these energy efficiency upgrades are not made very often. Um, uh, so let's talk about a little bit um, about distributional type of issues and heterogeneity, which is one of the things that this uh, workshop will be focusing on. And this is pretty much, you know, the end of my presentation as well. So uh, there's a lot of interest in looking at whether um, fuel price changes or electricity price changes trigger a different response in different groups of people. So you can imagine with a fuel price change, who's going to be impacted more, who's going to have to respond more? Is it going to be the high mileage drivers, the workers, the retirees, the young people, the old people? So we could, look in, could be looking at this kind of stuff. Over the decades, there has been a lot of research also on whether fuel taxes uh, or a, the if they exist or a carbon uh, tax that is incorporated into uh, the price of fuel is regressive. Uh, and, you know, I'll let you guys, you know, take a look at that literature. It's very vast and I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, I would just like to point out that if you're looking, for example, at the total emissions from using a certain type of equipment, a car or, or the AC in your house, you're really going to be calculating that uh, as the emissions per kilometer multiplied by the number of kilometers that you're traveling, or the emissions per hour of use of your AC unit multiplied by the number of hours uh, that you use it. And both of these elements that enter into this multiplication could uh, de could depend, could vary systematically with the level of income of the family uh, or the user. So that's something that we want to keep in mind. Uh, we also we might also want to give an international perspective to the to this kind of distributional type of issue. So we could wonder whether the emission intensity is higher in a less wealthy country. We could look, for example, at the imports and the exports of cars from certain countries into other countries and look at the what type of um, highly polluting or less highly polluting cars are bought in certain places. We could look at whether the hours of equipment use or the kilometers are also different in uh, different places. Um, I know that there has been a lot of interest in whether the subsidies to uh, the purchase of electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids are really captured by wealthy people or people that are that we're really uh, going to be buying these vehicles anyway. And finally, as the very last thing that I'm going to say, and I'm saying this in part because I do a lot of research on this, and in part also because I am a consumer and a beneficiary of uh, environmental regulations. As a person who enjoys uh, better air quality when uh, environmental regulation is effective, we, would, we should probably be looking also at the distribution of the benefits to the beneficiaries of environmental regulation. So for air quality, for example, we tend to think that the people that are really uh, enjoying almost disproportionately the, uh, the benefits of improved air quality are the elderly, people in compromised health, maybe children, uh, but, you know, pretty much every, everyone, in, in, I tend to think. With climate change, uh, people living in coastal areas or in areas that are likely to experience floods or in drought sensitive areas, Areas in poorer countries, future generation are also examples of special categories of uh, beneficiaries of environmental regulation. And I'm going to stop right here right now. Um, thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Anna, for a uh, fascinating presentation and covering so much ground uh, so, so quickly. Uh, I did have a burning question. I'm going to throw it at you, but we'll wait for Carolyn's remarks and then see if there's time for me to answer it. Uh, the obvious question that came to my mind, given that you're speaking from Washington, D.C., is the debate that's currently going on with regard to the gas, uh, the, the gasoline tax holiday. And, and, and my question was whether uh, you know, it would achieve the distribution of objectives uh, that it might be intended for. But uh, you know, we'll see if we get time to address that. But it's my great pleasure to uh, now uh, introduce our discussant for this session, uh, who is uh, Professor Carolyn Fisher 
uh, who is a research manager of the sustainability and infrastructure team in the development research group at the World Bank. Her work addresses issues of technical change, trade and carbon leakage in environmental policy design. Uh, she's a council member for the European Association of Environmental and Resource Economists, serves on expert advisory boards for research institutes in Europe and North America, and is co-editor of Environmental and Resource Economics. Uh, Carolyn, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks for these great uh, um, comprehensive presentations by Antoine and Anna. Um, I'll just make a few comments, one on... Um, on sort of in empirical studies of the impacts of environmental policies. And I, I really congratulate the OECD for um, both, you know, collecting the data, creating these indices and doing a lot of great work to be able to do these kinds of cross country um, comparisons that we see. Um, one question that I always have looking at, um, at these studies is, Sort of what what prices and policies are they are they really looking at? And it's it's very challenging. Um, I think often we can think of uh, policies can create sort of marginal prices, marginal costs, and average costs. Excuse me, Carolyn. Sorry to interrupt. We're not yes. seeing your screen. I don't know. If You're not it, seeing my slides. No, we're just seeing a black screen. At least I'm seeing a black screen. I am seeing your slides. Okay. Uh, okay. Then please go ahead. Then yeah. it might be not in presentation mode, but uh, they're visible. That's straight because I'm seeing it in presentation mode. Uh, are they advancing? No, um, it's I am stuck on the first on the cover, you know, the title slide. Uh, okay. Um, so the no, so definitely now they're advancing. Now they're okay. So this is. Uh, let me try again. I'm now is it in presentation now, yeah. mode? Not yet, but I'm seeing the screen now. This is completely mysterious. So I don't know, uh, was it Nicola? Did you want to share the slides instead? Zoom is We can do that, yeah, no problem. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the graphic I was showing, oh, here we go. So the next slide. And I'm sorry to waste, it, it's not, can you put it on the second slide? There, yeah, there we go. So, um, so a lot of times, what we're measuring are sort of the marginal prices that uh, policies create. So, so we're looking at, uh, you know, maybe some combination of energy prices, emissions pricing, so CO two taxes or trading prices, and and more and more also taking into account indirect. Uh, uh, forms of carbon pricing like uh, energy taxes or energy taxes net of subsidies. Um, and so these are these are the prices that you want to think about what are the incentives to reduce emissions? Um, what are the incentives on the margin? Um, but we're looking at issues of competitiveness, firm profits, long run incentives, um, average Average costs are uh, tend to be more important, and so in this case, you need to take in, into account the free allocation or tax exemptions. And it's off, it's harder to get data on this, and uh, you know these are likely to be to be very important and and um, to have like a true indicator of what the cost burden of environmental regulation is. So when question is in you know in terms of the index of environmental policy. As you noted, this is a big mix of policies, not you know, energy taxes, carbon pricing, but also mostly regulations. And regulations, you know, they may have some shadow costs uh, for emissions because you're putting a constraint on emissions uh, or some behavior, but they don't actually price the embodied emissions. So it's more like uh, a free allocation scenario. And different countries obviously have a very different mix of these policies. So, um, you know, I think a, a great avenue going forward is getting a better handle on the distinction between marginal and average cost pricing uh, in policies across countries, particularly for industrial sectors where competitive concerns are really important. Um, uh, next slide. Um, these issues may also be important from a consumer perspective. Uh, uh, and, you know, so policy design matters. Um, and, you know, thinking about distributional concerns, we have 
uh, you know, a, a common um, a, a common proposal is to uh, put a price on emissions and use the revenues uh, to rebate, say, you know, lump sum per household is a very gen overall a very progressive way of refunding the revenues. However, this masks a lot of when we just look at sort of income deciles, it's masking a lot of heterogeneity within each decile. So this is some work I did with Billy Pizer, uh, you know, looking at uh, hypothetical electricity regulation in the United States. Um, uh, but these issues, uh, this, it, these issues are global. And, and the part of the issue is when recycling the revenue, it's really hard to target the people to make sure that you know, you know, the poor are really held harmless. And so we see here, we compare this sort of cap and dividend proposal to a tradable performance standard, which is one of these things where you put you know, a, a marginal price on, but, uh, but uh, you know, the average embodied costs are, are not priced because you're freely allocating at the, at the intensity standard. There's a much, much fewer cost to pass on through the electricity prices, and you have much smaller variation uh, in impacts across households. Next slide. Um, so my colleagues at the World Bank have been doing a lot of work on uh, distributional impacts of climate and fiscal policies, and it's sort of a nice way to think of like the avenues of impacts here, many of which were covered by the previous two discussions. So we have you know, price impacts that will affect the consumers, the use of the revenue that will uh, affect households. Um, we have employment income impacts and also health um, co-benefits, which Anna uh, nicely raised in her discussion. So next slide. Um, and one interesting thing is, that, so the consumption incidence of carbon taxes in, in low income countries tends to be progressive. So um, this is why it's so important to do this kind of cross-country work. Um, to, I think too many, uh, you know, empirical studies really rely, you know, are focused on the U.S., where the distributional effects can be quite different. Especially since, you know, a lot of these uh, uh, fuel taxes are uh, are transportation fuels. Um, uh, and the situation is really quite different in at least uh, low-income countries. Next. Slide. Um, the use of the revenue is very important. So there are ways to, uh, you know, raise marginal prices and then redistribute the web, uh, the revenue in a way that is pro poor by boosting, uh, say, social security, safety net programs, or investments in infrastructure and access. So on the right, we have uh, investments in electricity access. Uh, coming from the um, carbon tax revenues. And this is something that tends to uh, really benefit the poor as well. So it's important not to look at the, the price and the use of the revenues in isolation. Uh, next. Um, uh, employment effects, when you, uh, you know, disaggregate by sector, by uh, skill level can be quite, quite different. And, and so again, designing a package of reforms that uh, may price emissions, uh, but recycle the revenues in a way, uh, it may, uh, you know, benefit uh, relative employment for low skilled workers. Um, for example, the previous slide had some evidence from the EU and some world EU on the left um, and um, Bulgaria on the right. I think the bottom is, is cut off, but, um, but there are ways that these uh, employment impacts can actually be equity um, enhancing. And the final slide, um, you know, and, and similarly for health co-benefits, um, so uh, Antoine was showing that, uh, you know, most of these policies are effective at, at reducing emissions. Um, CO2 emissions often come with a lot of a range of health co-benefits from lowering conventional air pollutants. Um, and these are especially important in uh, low and middle income countries. Um, and, uh, and these can, these, the distribution of these co-benefits can be quite, uh, can be, 
uh, progressive. This is a study in Mexico finding that, at least in rural areas, uh, uh, the uh, the effects may be um, uh, progressive and um, and a, somewhat uh, and possibly regressive in in urban areas. So these are these are all things to take into account when thinking about the distributional impacts of policies. Design really matters. And, and sort of the net effects of the policy um, uh, can be quite different than sort of the, the, the impacts that we calculate based on the marginal uh, price signal. So thanks. Sorry, it took me a second to unmute myself. Thanks very much, uh, Carolyn. And uh, I had a number of reactions, but uh, we are a few minutes over time. So what I would do is I would give uh, Antoine and Anna, um, uh, say a minute or two each to respond to some of the issues Carolyn raised. Um, there was one question which had been posed earlier in the chat, uh, which was, talking about environmental justice implications. Uh, so not necessarily the heterogeneity and impacts, uh, you know, differentiated by firms or by income groups, but, but also looking at the community dimension and the spatial heterogeneity. Uh, so uh, I just throw that in the mix. We do have one presentation by Joe Shapiro uh, tomorrow, uh, which uh, I believe will be focusing on the environmental justice uh, implications specifically, but I'm just going to, add that to the mix, but let me now pass the floor uh, perhaps first to Anna to respond to uh, the points Carolyn has raised or any other thoughts she might have in one to two minutes max, and then to Antoine uh, again uh, with the same time constraint. So Anna, please go ahead. Well, thank you. Well, I think that actually Carolyn, Carolyn did a great job, you know, raising some, some of the issues that um, neither one of us had uh, raised before. I would like to actually take this time to, um, to answer to your question that you had previously voiced about the, the one about, you know, dropping the uh, momentarily uh, the, uh, the, the federal tax from gasoline. Do I think it's going to be making a, a lot of difference? I think people are not gonna be changing their behavior much at all. I think they're gonna be continuing to drive just the same. Um, I'm telling you that from personal experience, but also because I know that the responsiveness to price, um, gasoline price is very, very modest anyway. What I think is going to happen is that that's simply going to be helping people. As a reminder, helping people you know, continue their activities without suffering too much of a, uh, of a uh, wallet um, hemorrhage, shall we say. Um, the federal tax is only about 18 cents uh, per gallon. So that would be 18 cents uh, divided by 3.8 if you want to convert that to a liter. Um, I don't know how long President Biden is thinking of keeping this um, holiday tax holiday on. I know that similar tax holidays are in place in Italy, for example, and in Germany as well. And I'm not sure if they're in place in France. Thanks very much, Anna. And uh, now to Antoine. Yeah, thanks a lot, Karin. I mean, this was really uh, great as always. Um, to me, you know, you pointed at the, the other main limitation of these empirical studies. I mean, I mentioned the fact that we're looking at historical data by, you know, virtue of the exercise. And that, of course, you know, might not tell us uh, a lot about the future uh, if, if things, you know, become very really different. And the other thing that you pointed out is that, you know, obviously these, these studies, um, which are really good at, you know, identifying the causal effect of some, you know, policies on, on some outcomes, are not, not able to, to capture these kind of, um, you know, overall impacts, you know, where you add, or you add to these the use of the revenues and, the, you know, the health care benefits and the general equilibrium effect. I mean, you know, you could, you could think of, of, of many things. Uh, and so, of course, that, that is something uh, ex extremely important. Uh, so, so I guess the conclusion is, you know, you need to combine uh, not only, you know, empirical work in all of these areas, but also, you know, perhaps modeling work so that, you know, where, which is a tool that is perhaps more, um, you know, geared at, at looking at these uh, different um, you know, channels uh, to, to, to together. Um, we, 
we've done some work on trying to get at these you know marginal versus average uh, cost uh, story the one big issue that we faced you know is, is really the um, the 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 constraints in, in terms of the, the, the data needs uh, that are required. We did this last year in a project on, on the Netherlands. And um, also, you know, because these typically all of these uh, free allocations, these, uh, these, these rebates, you know, they um, affect differently various types of firms. You have to look separately at SMEs or large firms, you know, because it all depends on how much you consume and things like this. So, it is very important, but also very difficult empirically. So um, I, I, I totally agree with you that you know this is one uh, very important research avenue. Uh, Shadul, I think we're we're running short of time, so uh, I'll, I'll stop here. But thanks again for the, the, the great discussion. Thanks very much, Antoine, and and and, and thanks to all, all all three of you, uh, Anna, Carolyn, and Antoine, for kicking the workshop uh, to 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 a great start. Uh, I, I hope, uh, Carolyn and Anna, you'll be able to stay on for the other sessions and perhaps respond to any questions that might be posed in the chat. Antoine now has to do another job, which is to chair the next session, which is on environmental policy, clean innovation and productivity. So Antoine, I pass the floor to you for session two. Yes, thanks a lot, Shadul. So uh, welcome everyone to, to the second session of uh, the workshop. Um, we're going to have uh, this one on, on environmental policy, clean innovation, and, and activity, as, as Shadow just said. So I'm Antoine de Chilopet. I'm a senior economist uh, in the Science, Technology, and Innovation Directorate um, at, at the OECD, and I'll be uh, chairing this session. I probably don't need to spend a lot of time to convince you um, that this is an extremely important session. Uh, the, 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 you know, there was this uh, interesting uh, report by the uh, International Energy Agency last year, where they laid out their uh, net zero emission scenario for 2050. One uh, important finding that, that came out from, from this report was that uh, if you look at 2030, we can probably get there by deploying, you know, existing technologies, uh, renewables, electric cars, and so on. But, you know, if you look at 2050, then... Uh, pretty much half of the technologies that we need, they are basically still in the lab. You know, they're at prototype stage, sometimes demonstration stage, but certainly not at the commercial phase. So the, the impact that um, policies can play in you know, boosting uh, the development and, and then the diffusion of um, low carbon technologies is, is extremely important. Um, and, and the second question, of course, which, which mat matters a lot from, from a policy perspective, is what are the potential benefits, uh, you know, for firms uh, to switching to, uh, to developing these new low carbon technologies um, or uh, adopting them? Um, you know, this, this idea that uh, uh, green growth will, will come from developing and adopting these new technology that there might be a front, you know, sort of first mover advantage in developing these, uh, these technologies has been around for, for, for decades. Um, and so the, the second question, uh, I think is also uh, of, of policy uh, relevance. So we have uh, five excellent speakers uh, in this uh, session. They're all uh, world-class experts on, on the topic. We'll start with uh, Professor David Pop. I don't really have a lot of time to uh, go through the CV of each one of you, and, and especially you, David, it would take a bit of time. So, so you'll, you'll excuse me for, for being brief. Uh, so you're the, the Caroline Ratkin Faculty Scholar in Public Administration and, and Policy at the University of uh, Syracuse. Uh, well known for all your work on uh, directing technical change climate and innovation. Uh, so I'll uh, pass the floor immediately to, to you, and then I'll introduce our next speakers as we uh, move along. So um, you all have about uh, 10, 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes for the presentation. So apologies in advance if at some point I have to become rude and, 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 and step in, but I would like us to go through all the presentation, then to have some time for, for Q and A's. So if you can try to all stick to the time, that would be most appreciated. David, the floor is open. Great, right. thank you, Antoine. So can everybody see my slides? Yes, absolutely. Great, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna 
my talk is going to be kind of an overview of the, the literature over the, over the last, say, 20, 10, 20 years or so on looking at um, how policies promote innovation on clean technology, really with, with a focus on clean energy. And Antoine kind of stole my introduction, so you're saving time, Antoine, so thank you. Um, so I believe this quote is from the report you were men mentioning, you know, that, you know, if we want to get to net zero, Right, the, uh, you know, there, we need a diverse range of technologies, you know, and you know the things that we haven't succeeded in yet. You know, trying to integrate renewables, you know, trying to integrate large-scale renewables into the grid. Thinking about offshore wind, carbon capture and storage, right? Those things are still in the development stage. You know, so, how do we move those technologies forward, and how do we move those technologies forward quickly? Um, and so, what I want to do in this talk is kind of highlight some of the key lessons um, that we've learned from past from past policies and past innovation, and thinking about how we might apply it to this next generation of technology. So just kind of a, a quick theoretical framing. So we think about clean technology innovation, there's two market failures that are really important, right? So one is the idea of environmental externalities. And so this one I think is fairly straightforward, the idea that pollution created in the production or the use of a product, but isn't included in the price. And so this is the role that environmental policy plays in the innovation literature, we often refer to this as, as demand pull policies. Right. There's also a second market failure though that's important. That's the idea that knowledge is a, is a public good. And the implication of that is that we have what are called knowledge spillovers, right? So additional innovations, you know, these could be new ideas, this could be copies that benefit the public as a whole, but not the original innovator, right? So Apple develops the first smartphone. They've made a lot of money selling iPhones, but you know, iPhones are not the largest share of the market now in smartphones, right? So these, all these other technologies came along that built off that and led to great things for society that Apple doesn't profit on, right? And so those spillovers are, are really important, right? So this is where science and technology policy, what we call technology push policy comes in, right? And this could be general. So intellectual property is an example of technology policy that benefits, you know, that's focuses on technology, but largely, it could also be very specific, right? having targeted subsidies for renewable energy, R&D. In principle, we could address these two externalities separately, use science policy to address the market failures and knowledge, have carbon pricing to get the prices right. right? We want to think a little more subtly about that, though. So first, I just want to point out that you know, science policy plays a role. One thing that's important is that it's not a substitute for environmental policy. Right, science policy can help lower the cost of environmental policies by bringing along some of these new innovations. But unless we get to the point where those technologies dominate, where the cost falls so low that they are the, the best choice, right? Science policy can help with the deployment, but now with the diffusion of technologies. Right, so I'm gonna start by thinking about kind of the role of broad-based policies, right? So the idea is that environmental policy creates incentives for private sector innovations by increasing demand, right? This is particularly important when we look at energy because you know, we have clean technologies that have higher costs. We think about energy, it's really the services that's provided, right? People care that the lights go on when they flip the switch, right? They don't care where the, where the electricity came from, right? Compare that to something like life sciences or IT where innovation affects the product itself, right? People care whether they have a smartphone or an Android phone, right? So that makes product differentiation difficult and that can make it difficult for innovators to profit. Right. This came up in the in the the first session today. You know, economists tend to prefer you know broad based market based regulation um, that minimizes compliance cost, provides greater incentives for innovation. Right, so command and control gives gives people incentives to meet the goals, but there's no reward for going beyond that. Right, market based options provide rewards for continual improvement. Right, so that can encourage more innovation. But I think it's important to think more broadly about the types of policies used. And I think we can make a second set of distinctions. That's between technology neutral policies. So carbon, carbon tax, cap and trade, renewable portfolio standards fit in here. So the idea you know, that we have a price on somehow on carbon and we let the market decide how people are gonna solve the problem. Versus technology specific policies, right? So the idea that technology specific policies, feed in tariffs, renewable auctions, technology mandates can often be focused on a particular type of technology. So if you look at the evidence on broad based policies, first we know that they do encourage innovation. Higher prices matter. So kind of the similar work, my work and work by Richard Newell and others found that the response to R&D to higher prices occurs quickly. 
get a sense of the magnitude effect. You're looking at renewable energy technologies, a 10% increase in prices is about a 3.5% increase in innovation. Um, Adrian et al. Antoine's one of the co-authors in this, 10% higher fuel price leads to about 10% more electric vehicle and hybrid patents, 4 to 6% more clean and gray, so this is energy efficiency. And also important here, you know, thinking about how the shapes, the direction of innovation reduces innovation on fossil fuel patents, right? So it's not just increasing one type of innovation, but also decreasing progress in other areas, which you know, is the goal in this case. It's also the case that prices alone are not enough to encourage energy efficiency innovation. Right? So there's two reasons here. Okay? One is that you know, there, there are some private benefits of saving money on energy, but there's also public benefits, reducing pollution. Right? So energy regu efficiency regulations can help here. Chris Niddle has work looking at fuel economy regulations to show that they did improve technological progress for cars, not for trucks, however. Joelle Nawali is a, is a really important paper getting at. We talked about salience in the, in the first session. Energy prices had less impact on innovation for home energy efficiency. And one reason for this is that, you know, this is particularly the case if you think about things like insulation that are less visible to consumers. And so they're really not making decisions on. And so building code changes play a more important role here. Finally, even if we have a broad based technology neutral policy, that policy still favors some technologies over others, right? Policies that let markets pick winners are gonna focus on the winner. It's gonna focus on the technologies that are closest to market, right? There's some work I did with um, colleagues at the OECD back about 10 years ago. At the time, wind, wind was cheaper than solar innovation. So countries that had renewable energy mandates focus on wind innovation. Where we saw solar innovation was countries that had guaranteed prices, so feed-in tariffs. Right? Solar in Germany is the example here, right? You know, the feed-in tariffs and, and for solar were very high in Germany. That played a big role in getting the cost of solar down. So this suggests a trade-off, a policy that promotes specific technologies may increase short-run compliance costs. So we can combine these broad-based policies with subsidies for target technologies that are furthest from the markets. So we'll talk about how to do that next. And we also can think about the role of government energy R&D. So we're thinking about what tools to use, what, um, what policies to, and what technologies to target. We want to think about you know, what other market failures might play a role. So one issue is capital market failures. Right? Energy innovations take a long time to get to market. They often have large fixed costs. As I mentioned before, they can, prior differentiation can be difficult. So compare Tesla, which is able to market itself as a brand, versus solar panel, which is really a more of a commodity. So there is some evidence that government support can help overcome these funding hurdles. Sabrina Howell doing work on U.S. Department of Energy grants for small businesses uh, found the recipients were receive more venture capital and more patents and so on. However, demand still matters. Um, so looking at the early stage RPE awards, Goldstein and all find that you know, these companies were not, were, were not more likely to exit, so to have a successful final result. Um, and a recent paper looking at venture capital, changing policy expectations play a big role on VC investments. So still having that demand side policy is important. Path dependency can, um, can be another justification for subsidy. You know, so we're not going to have char charging infrastructure until there's electric vehicles. And people won't buy electric vehicles for the charging infrastructure. So subsidies can help to address that problem. Learning by doing is another one. So often used to justify tax credits, other types of deployment policies. Here I would say, you know, the work tends to find that the learning by doing effects are tend to be small, and that the targeted policies that are in place are more. Um, then, then sufficient for would be justified by learning by doing alone. So learning by doing usually is not going to be enough of a justification for targeted subsidies. Finally, we think about the role of the spillovers. You know, might spillovers for clean energy be different? Right? These are new technologies. And Tuana has, has a working paper that showed that clean patents generate larger knowledge spillovers than the dirty technologies that they replace. Um, and work Jacqueline's going to be talking later. She was a co-author in this paper. We look at the enabling technologies, so storage, smart grid. We find these technologies are more radical, more original. Right? So these are the clean energy technologies. The dark blue here, the dark red line is kind of generic technologies. Clean technology is kind of comparable to that, but consistently kind of these energy storage, smart grids, and so on, more radical, more original than technology in general. Right? Suggesting that there are, are potential big spillovers here. So these are the tech type of technology you want to think about you know, targeting kind of these enabling technologies that are still far away. They have a big public goods role that, you know, that we want to get to market. 
So turning finally to energy R&D policy, what technology to support, where we want to focus on not crowding out private research to do things that the private sector won't do. So basic research, things that are further for the market. Specialized technology, the small market, industrial energy efficiency might fit in here. And things that you know, they have these big public good benefits. So improved electricity, electricity transmission, energy storage, and so on. Here, I see the common theme is kind of these high risk, high reward projects. And so to, to close and give an example of you know, how can governments do this? How can you know, one challenge for governments is high risk, high reward means projects are going to fail. And failures are often a, a problem for politicians, right? The DOE is Advanced Projects, Advanced Research Project Agency, so RPE. Is a, is a case has been very successful in the U.S. promoting this high risk, high reward innovation, right? And they do this a couple of ways. They, one is that the program sets very clear, measurable goals for various stages of the research, right? Realizing the goals are going to be a finished product or look, working at early stage things, but it also gives the program directors the ability to terminate these projects or to redirect funds, right? So it takes the decision of funding these high risk, high reward things out of the hands of politicians, right? So to sum up, right, you know, even if we have broad-based carbon pricing, there is a role for targeted policies. With these R and D, in particular, these targeted policies are not a substitute for clean for energy and environmental policies, but it's going to complement them. And finally, just note that these target policies also play an important political role, as so they can increase demand and they help to build support for future broad-based policies. So thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot, David. Perfectly on time. Excellent. Thanks for the, the, the very broad uh, overview of uh, 20 years of literature in 10 minutes. That's quite impressive. Uh, I'm going to try to save some time for questions at the end. So I'm going to move straight uh, to, to our next speaker and then we'll, we'll take also questions from that are coming through the, 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 the chat and, and, and the Q&A. Uh, so the floor is now to Damien Dussault. Uh, is an environmental uh, economist at uh, the OECD's Environment Directorate, leading his work on, on clean innovation uh, over there. Uh, so Damien, the floor is yours. Thank you, Antoine, uh, for the floor. I hope you can see my slides. Uh, today, yes. I'm uh, very glad to talk about the economic consequences of green innovation. Let me start with the lessons uh, learned and the key remaining policy issues. Over the last decade, the OECD has empirically analyzed uh, the joint impact of environmental policies on environmental and economic performance. And as previously mentioned by Antoine, we find that overall uh, stringent environmental policies have a large and positive impact on environmental performance of firms. While the impacts found on economic performance are smaller but heterogeneous, they can be negative for pollution intensive firms and sectors, but also positive for cleaner firms and cleaner sectors. At the same time, research from academia and the OECD uh, find that environmental policies uh, successfully trigger green innovation. And David Pop just um, did a, a great summary of that. However, uh, there is a little empirical evidence on the impact of green innovation on economic performance. Knowing more about this link is crucial to know how public policies can help the emergence of the technologies that are necessary uh, to address pressing environmental challenges while maximizing the positive impacts on the economy. Today, I will present uh, two pieces of OECD work that shed some light on the relationship uh, between green innovation and economic performance. The first piece of work focuses on the effect of policy-induced low-carbon innovation on current economic performance in the manufacturing sector. And the second piece of work estimates the economic benefits of early green innovation in the automotive sector. The first paper uh, that I will present was recently published by Tobias Cruz and Antoine de Chelequet. And in this paper, they first analyze the effect of environmental policy stringency on firm level low carbon innovation. And they do that on directly regulated firms, but they also analyze the effect of environmental policy stringency on indirectly regulated firms through supply chains uh, links upstream and downstream. And while they find a strong and positive effect on directly regulated firms, 
they found uh, that policy stringency in upstream and downstream sector does not impact green innovation significantly. In this paper, they also analyzed the effect of clean innovation on the economic performance of firms. And I will focus on this latter part of the paper, which is uh, the core topic of my presentation. To estimate this effect, they use the following model, where economic performance is a function of the firm low carbon patent stock, colored here in green. They have data at the firm, country, sector, and year level for over 7,000 manufacturing firms, over 19 countries, and 25 years. The economic performance is measured by either productivity or value added uh, using data from all this. The stock of low carbon patents is computed using the wire 2 tagging system developed uh, with the European Patent Office using the data from PATSAT. The problem here is that economic performance and green innovation are simultaneously determined. The higher your economic performance, the more you can, in theory, invest in green innovation. So to make sure they can estimate the causal effect of green innovation, the authors used what we call in our jargon an instrumental variable in which I'm not going into much detail today for the sake of time. Finally, the authors also include firm level controls and various sets of fixed effects. And when they estimate different variations of their model, they find no evidence that policy induced low carbon innovation at time t minus one harms or improves the economic performance of firms at time t. Now, let me talk about the second piece of work that estimates the economic benefits of early green innovation in the automotive sector, which provides some responses on why the previous paper finds that current green innovation has no effect on current economic performance. This paper is a preliminary work, which is a team effort between my two colleagues, Alberto Agnelli and Helia Costa and myself. The paper aims uh, to respond to the following question. Does fast green innovation pay off when price signals get stronger? To address it, we conduct an econometric analysis of the car on the car manufacturing sector. Why we do that? Because it contributes to a large portion of global carbon emissions and that significant clean innovation occurred in this sector over the last two decades. Our contribution is to estimate the impact of fuel prices on car manufacturers' economic performance as a function of different kinds of innovation, dirty, clean, and gray. Clean technologies are hybrid and EV cars, and gray technologies correspond to fuel saving. In addition, we also test for different timings. Our intuition was that the economic returns to green innovation could take several years to materialize. To perform our estimation, we use panel data between 2005 and 2020 at the level of the firm, country, and year. We measure economic performance by the market share of the manufacturer equal to the percentage of the number of cars uh, sold in the country in a specific year provided by national automobile associations. We cover the 19 largest car manufacturers that account for 95% of market shares in eight OECD countries. Our measure of green innovation is based on PATSTAT data and is a share of the firm's patent stock in different types of technologies, dirty, fuel saving, and cleaner cars, following the classification developed by Agion and some other famous researchers. Finally, uh, we use uh, OECD data on fuel prices, to which drivers were confronted to. Learning how fuel prices interact with green innovation and economic performance can shed light on the impact of fuel taxes and fuel subsidies that reflect environmental policy stringency. We estimate a model where the market share is a function of fuel price interacted uh, with the share of patent stock in different technologies in previous periods of time and negated by K. We include firm year, country firm, and country year fixed effect, as well as control variables. And this graph shows you the effect of fuel price on market share when the share of gray patent stock 
increases by one percentage point for different flags. We find that when fuel price increases, innovation in fuel efficiency pays off eight or more years later. For cleaner cars, which is not illustrated here for the sake of time, the payoff is earlier, around seven years, but is half the size of the effect found for gray technologies. And finally, we do not find a significant effect for dirty technologies. To conclude, we find that innovating in green technologies pays off under several conditions. First in the medium and long run, but also when price signals get stronger. But then why no immediate returns when price signal gets stronger? And we formulate two main hypotheses. The first one is that the process between innovation and market commercialization takes time. The second one is that consumers might not respond immediately. They already have a car or they have poor information. So to go a little bit further, we tested the role of consumers' interest in fuel prices captured by Google Trends indicators. And we find that the higher the interest in fuel prices, the higher and earlier the economic return on past clean innovation when fuel prices increase. This suggests that information is really key to trigger clean technology adoption. We derive the following policy implications. Supporting green innovation can lead to economic gains in the medium and long run when price signals get stronger. And finally, providing key information to consumers might lead to larger adoption of lower and leading cars and higher economic returns for early innovators. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to responding to your questions. Thank you very much, Damien. Um, very interesting. It reminds me of David's work on the uh, also the very long time lag between the uh, public R&D expenditure and the uh, resulting um, private innovations. Okay. It's, I have to say it's becoming a bit embarrassing to chair this session because it's quite okay when David cites a couple of my papers, but then when Daniel starts presenting my paper in full, it anyway. I uh, hope uh, Jacqueline, you're not <laughs> going to do that. And um, so Jacqueline uh, is our next speaker. Uh, you're the Fred King Career Development Professor of Entrepreneurship uh, and an Assistant Professor uh, at the MIT uh, School of Management, Sloan School. So. Uh, the floor is yours, and I can already confirm we, we can see your uh, slides beautifully. Thank you. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for having me on this panel and to all the participants that are here. Um, it's really great to be able to, you know, actually see some, some co-authors on the panel as well. So this is a lot of fun. Um, so uh, can you see my slides? Did that just advance? Okay, great. So I knew the previous speakers would do a fantastic job of kind of summarizing a lot of the literature and what we know about what policies are going to impact green innovation. So I wanted to take a slightly um, different approach here and think about actually some, um, I'm going to focus on three policy considerations specifically that seem to be kind of often ignored um, in policy design and also things that have been kind of understudied in the academic literature so far as well, um, but go through a few few papers um, that I think are, are trying to start to tackle these issues. Um, so the what I'm going to be trying those three kind of policy implications or three um, policy types that are frequently kind of ignored are going to fall into three categories: um, policy interactions, um, human capital policy, and I'm going to talk a bit about the limitations of divestment, especially with how um, hot this is kind of at the moment. So policy um, interactions, uh, what do I mean here? So policies are frequently kind of designed in silos, um, right? So this can be anything from um, the environmental, different environmental policies, as well as um, R&D subsidies and, and how those two kind of uh, come together as well. Um, but we don't really know a ton about, you know, how those interactions um, might impact the effects of each of those, right? So if firms um, are able to kind of tap into both, um, how does that kind of change the implications? Um, so the first paper I'm just going to mention here briefly is one that actually doesn't look specifically at green innovation, but starts to get to this issue, uh, looking at the interaction of R&D grants and tax credits. Um, and the idea here is that basically when you increase the tax credit rate, 
um, what does that do to the marginal effect of grant funding on um, R&D spending? Or you could think about some other innovation outcomes, but in this paper, I just looked at R&D spending. Um, and what we can find is that for smaller firms, increasing that tax credit rate enhances the effect of direct grants on R&D spending. And it appears as though this can be attributed to financing constraints. So small firms tend to have a harder time overcoming kind of upfront um, a large fixed cost to get a project started, um, and then having both really uh, helps them overcome that. On the other hand, for larger firms, increasing the R&D tax credit and it dampens the effect of direct um, uh, grants on R&D spending. And we think this is, you know, kind of can be attributed to the lack of financing constraints. And so thinking about how these two interact and whether there should be some type of um, policy design based on firm size um, is just one thing to possibly think about here when we do start to consider those interactions. Now, specifically in the green innovation space, um, this kind of very early stage work that I have with Sugana Srivastav, who's a PhD student at Oxford, um, is starting to tackle kind of the two market failures that David mentioned uh, earlier in his talk around how innovation for green in green energy um, is characterized by not just the environmental externalities, but also these knowledge spillovers. Um, so these two market failures, when they come together, we think about how um, carbon taxes or other environmental um, kind of subsidies uh, can start to attack the environmental externalities, but then on the innovation side or the knowledge spillovers rather, um, we also often think about different R&D subsidies, whether they're kind of broad-based um, or uh, tech specific. And so in this paper, we're looking at the interaction of carbon taxes and uh, specifically technology neutral R&D subsidies or R&D tax credits. Um, and what we're finding so far, uh, so we're taking a regression discontinuity approach in this paper, um, the, the finding kind of at the moment. So the idea here is that technology neutral tax, credit, uh, tax credits could either enhance or dampen um, the effects of carbon taxes on innovation. Um, and so the idea here is that, um, so how might this happen? Um, basically, if you think about how a carbon tax might induce my own um, potential um, incentives to innovate in green energy and my, my efforts there, um, it's also going to impact my, um, my competitors' incentives to innovate. Um, and so you can imagine how, okay, even if we have, we have this positive effect of the carbon tax on my own innovation, it, when it induces others to also innovate, this is going to increase the spillovers um, within the market from those other firms. And this could either um, kind of incentivize me to even invest more because I can uh, learn from those spillovers. So this is a bit of a like a, the other side of thinking about how we uh, spillovers tend to we think about spillovers affecting the incentives to innovate. Um, but if I need to invest in R and D to learn from those spillovers, that interaction might have a positive effect. But there also is a bit of a, a rivalry or kind of business dealing thing that goes on um, where you could have this negative or dampening effect. Um, so it becomes this empirical question. Um, and so I don't want to go too far into the results on these so far because uh, we're still kind of trying to hang, we don't want to hang our hat on them quite yet. Um, but we're just trying to really tackle the fact that there are these two different market failures and two different types of policies that are frequently used to, um, to tackle them. The second thing that I want to talk about here is human capital policy. So essentially the idea here is that of course, innovation requires human capital, researchers, scientists. Um, of course, they're the ones that are kind of coming up with the ideas, um, but we don't actually know. So that means we have to think about kind of the supply of researchers or how do we start to um, actually produce researchers maybe at the perhaps PhD dissertation type of level. Um, and so this is around, you know, what is the incentive um, that, or what's, you know, what drives the decision for uh, students to start studying green innovation versus something else, or even just to enter, say, that market for ideas in the first place. Um, and so what we, we see uh, so far is that a lot of um, policies that are looking to incentivize green innovation really focus on the firm side, uh, the firm side of things, um, rather than kind of directly creating scientific human capital. And of course, focusing on firms um, is, is basically, you know, there's this implicit kind of assumption that this will then increase the demand for innovators, of course. Um, but when the supply of inventors um, is 
inelastic, which is also often the assumption in a lot of um, kind of big tech change models. And also I think what has mostly been found in previous literature, um, when it's inelastic, this is those demand side policies are essentially just gonna increase the wages of higher skilled workers. Um, and so in some very, another kind of early stage project here, um, some co-authors and I are looking at what is the impact of those of potential human capital policies in particular. So this is gonna be the impact of DOE funding on, um, on the, the dissertations that come out of US universities and also the topics of those dissertations um, to basically ask, you know, what is the impact on just increasing the, the production of, of new inventors and the direction that they go into. Um, and so, so the I, so what we are doing, you know, I just I just described this, um, but we are we're currently finding some early stage evidence or trying to compare basically the amount, the number of dollars that need to go into each, and we find that there there is some elasticity there. It's not as it's not as inelastic as as usually is assumed. Um, and so this is just something that we need to think a little bit more about, um, and maybe potentially in the future, what are the trade offs between demand side versus supply side policy in order to um, kind of increase that supply of researchers. And um, lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about the kind of current um, divestment movements that uh, has been going on for a bit, but also has like really taken off recently around how um, you know, we can think about maybe changing kind of consumer preferences might start to drive some innovation in the context of if, if you know, pressure from um, consumers or just interest from investors um, does start to drive out some of these dirty um, firms or put pressure on dirty firms. Um, you know, is this one way to kind of transition to a cleaner economy? And a lot of this uh, kind of the movement itself and um, discussion and literature around it is really around um, how these firms exiting from the market, but we also can think about these how firms might actually respond via innovating instead. And this kind of raises some questions actually around whether divestment versus continued investment might be a better um, avenue for, for driving that innovation. Um, so this is something that I've been starting to think about just kind of recently. Um, and also before I get into the work that I've been thinking about here, I um, just want to highlight that one of the, the key tools that's frequently used for investors to assess whether a company is kind of green or dirty or what, whether they want to divest are these ESG indicators, um, which I'm sure a lot of people in this audience are familiar with, but they're basically this, you know, it's a black box of a ton of questions that evaluate different practices of the firm um, and their outcomes or their performance um, to try to understand, you know, a, does kind of moving towards um, environmental kind of preferences impact um, the firm performance or exit and things like that. Um, and so I just like want to briefly think about, you know, how does how could divestment actually impact green innovation or innovation in general? The idea here is that, say, from an economics perspective, one of the, the key mechanisms is, is um, related to the cost of capital. Um, so the idea here is if um, a firm is, is selling stock or, or somebody is selling stock, this is they're going to lower the price to attract buyers. Um, this will make it more expensive uh, to finance future investments. Um, and so this increase in the cost of capital is going to reduce investment opportunities. Um, so here we might think about actually how firms will innovate less um, if they're really dependent on that type of external capital. Um, and then, of course, if they um, at the same time, if the buyer of those stocks is kind of less environmentally conscious, which we might think is, is the case if they're buying those stocks, um, does that then mean that they are the firm is less likely to innovate because of the person that kind of has a seat at the table to influence um, firm decisions? So this also becomes kind of an empirical question here. Um, and I, I've only been able to find, I guess, like one kind of key paper recently that's that's looking at this, um, more so on the, the the side of firm exit, but still in this um, the, trying to take seriously the cost of capital question. And so far, they're uh, finding that there really is a a tiny effect. Um, so in order, the two conditions basically for um, the cost of capital channel to work is that you need a, a, a large enough increase in the cost of capital. And then from the perspective of urgency and meeting the Paris Agreement um, targets, it has to be kind of fast enough. Um, and so what they find is that in theory, there's only a tiny effect. And then empirically, they find no effect when they're looking at um, uh, the cost of capital when firms are kind of included in the leading socially conscious US index. Um, and that in order to make um, any type of just to kind of increase the cost of capital by more than one percent, more than 80 percent of investable wealth would have to be um, divested. Um, 
uh, so or impact investors like going towards clean energy would need to be a very large portion. Um, and so this kind of, I think, it continues to raise questions about what is the potential for divestment to start to drive that innovation. Um, whereas, you know, continuing to invest in these, say, even dirty companies, let alone kind of clean tech companies, allows you to, it puts, it, it provides you with a seat at the table. So if you are environmentally conscious and you're a big shareholder, could you start to influence the management decisions or innovation pursuits within the company? Um, and this is where I think actually the ESG indicators might have potential to offer um, even new insight that uh, isn't often not exploited in, in the literature. And I, I don't think with investment decision-making either, and that's just unpacking those ESG indicators to understand what is it that firms are doing um, in order to uh, actually produce those innovations. So thinking about management quality and different strategies. Um, and so you really need to unpack those to, to provide that kind of insight. Um, and this is just a, a plot here where I'm breaking down some data from the Transition Pathways Initiative, um, which is based at the LSE, looking at, so for firms that either are on kind of, um, they are on track for meeting those Paris agreements uh, versus uh, those that are not, and what they would call a management quality score based on these different practices. And you can see here that um, those that so the the it's from zero to four is that quality of management practices essentially, and so you can see that as that quality increases, um, whether the the firm is kind of on track for meeting the Paris agreements um, increases as well. Um, so this kind of can provide just a little bit more insight into what is what what is it that's working um, versus not. And so I will uh, stop there, and um, looking forward to everybody's questions and comments. Many thanks, many thanks, Jacqueline, for the very interesting talk. Uh, again, 10 papers in 10 minutes, about. Um, thanks a lot. So uh, we're going to move to the next uh, presentation now. So uh, we have Professor uh, Junji Deng. I hope uh, my pronunciation is uh, okay-ish. So you're the director of the uh, Initiative for Sustainable Development at Duke uh, Kunshan University and associate professor of environmental economics uh, at Duke as well. So impacts of carbon pricing on firm competitiveness uh, in China, I think, is, is, is the topic of your talk. The floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Antoine. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, a sequel of my research on evaluating the effectiveness of carbon pricing uh, on firm competitiveness uh, with a focus on uh, firm uh, innovation and the financial consequence. So if um, we have compiled uh, comprehensive data of patents for uh, and uh, sought out the low carbon patenting and China actually uh, the low, uh, low carbon patenting has been growing dramatically over the past three decades. Uh, in 1990, China had only three patents uh, can be classified as low carbon patents. But in 19, uh, so sorry, this should be the, not, not 1999, this is, should be the 2019. Uh, that's the uh, close to 50,000. And in comparison to the United States and the, the growth of the low carbon innovation in China has been uh, amazing. So what drives the China's low carbon innovation uh, does the carbon ETS play a role in this process? This is the uh, question that we try to answer in my research. So a little bit of background of carbon marketing in China. Uh, so China has been experimenting with carbon emission trading system since early uh, 2000 by participating in the clean development mechanism that's a project-based carbon market, mainly selling credits to the European market. Uh, later, China started its own, uh, the voluntary market, but it was not very successful. The first series uh, test, uh, the pilot uh, started in 2011 and formally launched, started the trading in 2013. And the last year, China launched the national carbon ETS. So China had the, the pretty long history of pilots with carbon ETS. And in this paper, uh, in this talk, I will just focus on the regional carbon ETS because this is uh, the history of this ETS pilots is long enough, uh, provides us the essential data to evaluate these impacts on firms. So China's regional carbon ETS is a plausible natural experiment because seven jurisdictions 
predictions were selected as the carbon market pilots and uh, there are two stages of the market. Uh, announced in 2011 and started the trading in 2013 and covered a wide range of industries, uh, mainly electricity, but also including manufacturing and building in some pilots. Allowance allocation mainly free. Uh, there are two approach, mass-based and rate-based. Uh, the vast majority are rate-based, uh, but still there are some mass-based approach. So the uh, regional ETS pilots uh, suffered from uh, several issues. A major issue, the carbon price is pretty low, uh, but compare the carbon price uh, in these regional pilots with the carbon price in California, in Reggie, well, it, it's not that low, but, but the most uh, worrisome is, is the trend. Uh, but the, for the trading, that's the very infrequent. So this uh, thin carbon market, uh, with a very limited number of buyers and the sellers on this market. So we, with this market, we can help thinking. Is a thin carbon market effective in incentivize emission reduction and also help firms to reduce their cost of compliance? So we, we do have several questions to ask uh, in terms of firm competitiveness. First, can low carbon price incentivize emission reductions? And what's the financial consequence? And can the ETS stimulate innovation? And can innovation uh, mitigate the cost of compliance? Uh, last but not least, uh, do fragmented carbon markets uh, lead to carbon leakage? Uh, so this talk, I extract the res main results from several papers and two main papers are still in the work. And But I, I, I will introduce the last one on carbon leakage very briefly, but the focus will be on innovation and emission and uh, the financial outcomes. So the main results, if you trust the identification is solid. So we find that the regional ETS indeed is effective in reducing firm emissions. Uh, so the in terms of the outcome, we uh, pay attention to total emissions and emission intensities. The main effect uh, starts to kick in when the trading started. Uh, that's the after 2013. So when the emission trading started, uh, those uh, firms that are covered by ETS reduced their emission by 16.7% uh, in terms of total emission. So this is not a trivial uh, number. Uh, in terms of emission intensity, it's also reduced by close to 10%. So what's the channels of emission reduction? We find the channel mainly through, uh, we can still focus on the right panel. The channel mainly through the energy conservation. So the, and we look at the energy efficiency here, we can find the energy efficiency. Uh, it also has a negative impact, but it's not a statistically significant. And also the firms reduce their emission intensity uh, and they achieve the reduction in emission intensity uh, through fuel switching from mainly coal to natural gas. So the channels of the mechanism mainly through energy saving and fuel switching. We are concerned with the economic outcomes of the ETS on firms. So we classify three categories of those uh, outcomes, input, output, and productivity. So first, let's take a look at the input. We find that those covered firms reduced their labor and capital input. However, we found no statistical, uh, the significant impact on their output. So they pretty much maintain uh, the similar level of output. So the firms reduce their input, uh, but maintain the same level of output. It means that these firms, they might have increased their productivity. So by the four productivity indicators, we find that for TFP, two TFP indicators, they are uh, positive and significant. It means that ETS incentivize those covered firms to increase their productivity and the productivity increase help them to reduce the cost of compliance. So where's the source of productivity? Well, it's very naturally, this is related to innovation. So we started, what's the impact 
of the ETS on low carbon patenting. Low carbon patenting as one proxy for innovation, although this is not a perfect, but this is pretty much the, the best variable that, that's available. So we look at the share of low carbon patents in all patents, we found that ETS increased the share of low carbon patents by 2.1 percentage points. Well, although this might look small, but this is indeed, this is a very significant uh, economic significance, very strong because the share of low carbon patents in all patents very low. Uh, this is a pretty much close to 2%. So this almost double the, the share of low carbon patents. And we also find that the, the increasing of low carbon patents mainly occur in the intensive innovation. So there are three types of patents in China, invention patent, utility patent, and another one is uh, related to the, uh, the, the design that's irrelevant in this case. So the mainly the increase of the low carbon patents uh, is in the invention patents. It means that the intensive, uh, the ETS also stimulates more intensive, high quality innovation. So how those innovation help these firms to adapt to the regulation? So we use the uh, low carbon patents accumulated before the, the ETS uh, to study its impact of its financial performance after the launch of the ETS. We find that for pilot, uh, for across our AROE uh, and ROCE, we find that for these pilots, uh, low carbon patterns help these firms, uh, they uh, to better adapt to the carbon ETS. So there's a, a positive effect, but this effect uh, starts to fade out in, in, in the long term. But for non-pilots, the low carbon patterns has no effect on that, their financial performance at all. Well, this is very intuitive because uh, these firms, they are not covered by ETS. So the low carbon patterns uh, should have uh, no significant impact on their financial performance. To conclude, uh, we have uh, a, a couple of findings uh, from China's regional carbon ETS. First, we find that the China's regional ETS, they are effective in reducing emissions. Uh, the effectiveness mainly after the start of allowance trading. Uh, the channel is mainly through energy conservation and fuel switching. The second, we did not find uh, significant uh, negative financial impacts. Uh, the firms reduce input, inputs, improve productivity, and maintain output. And also, we find very strong signal that ETS leads to directed technical changes, uh, improves both quantity and the quality of low carbon patenting. And the innovation indeed offsets the cost of compliance. Uh, the last one is important, but I did not uh, highlight in this talk. We, we, we do find that the fragmented carbon markets uh, lead to carbon leakage and the firms ship production activities in the corporate ownership network. Uh, so that's all for my presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. It, it's really interesting to see those results coming from China that uh, confirm or, I mean, they, they, they go in the same direction, it looks like, as the, all the work that was done on the uh, emissions trading system in Europe. So uh, in the Q&A, uh, I have time, I'll ask you about uh, if, if there are also any differences. Um, so it's now time to, to move to the, the last uh, presentation of this session. So we have now uh, Yuko Kanamori. Uh, Professor Yuko Kanamori, your uh, research, senior researcher sorry, at the Japanese uh, National Institute for Environmental Studies. Uh, and so we will end the session with you. So the floor is yours for, for 10 minutes. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, today, I talk about the analysis to achieve a carbon neutral society using AIM, Asia Pacific Integrity Model. Um, I'm really, I, I am worried about my presentation is fit or not <laughs> in this session. Anyway, I'll start my presentation. Now, AIM is uh, uh, one of the major integrated model uh, 
to uh, analysis the climate change issues. And this model has been developed from 1990. And um, Japanese government revised the GHC mitigation target in 2020 and 2021. The first in 2020, the uh, uh, Japanese government uh, revised the, uh, the in 2050s uh, carbon reduction target, uh, and uh, they set the new target to achieve the carbon neutrality. After that, in, uh, last year, uh, the government changed the 2030s uh, reduction target. Uh, it, it's the level of the GHG reduction is 46% reduction compared to 2013 reduction. This uh, 2013 and the 2015 reduction target is not so uh, ambitious one compared to uh, other countries, but this, uh, this target is very um, uh, difficult and um, challenging uh, value for us. So uh, <clears throat> uh, we think uh, major directions toward low carbon society is uh, our uh, reduction in energy consumption and the use of lower carbon energy sources and energy transition, it means the electrification in addition to these measures uh, to achieve carbon neutrality, uh, we need the negative emission technologies. Moreover, role of social transformation will be important to real <coughs> realize carbon neutrality. So our team uh, uh, tried to analyze uh, the future target of GHG emissions in Japan. This is a model or model structure. Uh, this figure shows the model structure. We use three models. One, first, uh, we use the AIMCGE. Uh, this is a uh, uh, computable general computable general equilibrium model, and this is economic model. And using this model, we estimate the future IO table and service demand in energy use sector. After that, uh, we estimate the uh, uh, energy, energy demand uh, using the AM and the use. Uh, this model is a uh, bottom, bottom up type model uh, with the detail technology selection framework. And after that, uh, uh, after, after that, uh, our electricity demand for 10 regions in Japan is calculated from electricity demand for Japan. Uh, and using AIMM or GP. M, uh, multi, multi region opti optimal generation planning model, uh, our power generation planning was estimated. Uh, using the uh, this AIM uh, output of AIM NDUS and AIM MOGPM, uh, we can estimate the, uh, we can get the energy consumption and the sheet emission and GHG emissions. Uh, this Slide shows the population GDP service demand in 2050. Uh, and we set the two scenarios. First scenario is the technology scenario. Uh, the net zero emissions are achieved through de deploying a wide range of low carbon technologies. And, and the second scenario is technology plus social transform transformation scenario. Uh, in, the, in addition to technology scenario, the social transformation is assumed. The social transformation reduces energy service demand with the help of progress of digitalization in the circular economy. The, the, uh, the main um, contents of this scenario showed here. 
and uh, we chose the uh, some result of our of our analysis. The first shows uh, uh, energy related CO2 and the GH emissions. Uh, please let me show the left figure. Regarding the energy related CO2 emissions in 2050, direct emission from fossil fuels decreased to almost zero. And the emissions from uh, synthetic fuel remains due to offset by bags and uh, net CO2 emissions are achieved. Regarding JTZ emissions in 2050, uh, methane CH4 and N2O emissions also remain uh, this green part. Uh, in order to achieve GHG neutral, almost 100 megaton CO2 negative emissions uh, are needed. It's, uh, this the negative emission technology include the uh, BECS afforestation uh, and other measures. And this slide shows the uh, result of additional investment uh, needed to achieve net zero. Uh, uh, in terms of the amount of additional investment needed to achieve the, uh, net zero, investment in ins insulation sorry, insulation of buildings, uh, this yellow part and the gray part, and renew, uh, renewable energy, these, these parts account for a large share. Um, the uh, annual average uh, additional investment cost uh, from 2040 to 2050 is about 10 trillion Japanese yen. And uh, Net zero imports in 2080 uh, were about 60 trillion yen, but import will fall by about uh, 12 trillion and in 2050 due to reduce the dependence of fossil fuels. So, uh, oh, this the amount of additional investment is enormous. But we think that it is possible to uh, pay because the cost of energy import can be suppressed. Uh, the, this is the last slide. The implications from our analysis. First point is the social transmission uh, could increase certainty of achieving net zero. Uh, there, there is a much uncertainty regarding the development of the dis, uh, dissemination of low carbon technologies. In order to enhance the feasibility of net zero jet emissions, it is important to make effort to social transformation into a society where service demand can be decoupled with energy demand by promoting the digitalization and circular economy. And second implication is electrification. Uh, electrification and the maximum utilization of renewable energy power generation potential. Why the potential of photo photovoltaic and wind power is much higher than the other renewables. Both are highly variable power sources. To address variability, it is necessary to ensure uh, flexibility by com combining the various power sources, storing electricity and implementing in the regional interchange. The third implication is our maximum introduction of low carbon, uh, low carbon technology in order to dis disseminate 100% low carbon technology on a stock basis in 2050. It is necessary to achieve 100% dissemination on a flow basis at the early stage. In the next 10 to 15 years, it will be necessary to increase the acceptance of social society towards the mass dissemination of uh, low carbon technology in terms of both hardware and software. The last implication is acceleration of the development of innovative technology. It is difficult to completely eliminate GT emissions. Therefore, it is also necessary to take measures to capture and store atomos 
ferric CO2 to offset the emitted GHG, we must accelerate the development of these innovational technology with a view to utilizing overseas resources. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuko. And uh, don't worry, your presentation is uh, totally relevant. In fact, <laughs> I, I realized when you were talking that we should have uh, started with your presentation, perhaps because it, it's, it's a great illustration of you know, the, the role of uh, technology and, and innovation across all sectors in the economy. And in particular, I, I was struck by the, the, the small effect you know, of these uh, behavioral changes, what you call societal changes, compared to you know, deployment of uh, alternative low carbon technologies. Uh, you know, we're not going to get there with just uh, some, some small behavioral changes. That's what I took from your book. All right, uh, so we started a bit late, so I think we, we have now uh, at, you know, at least 20 minutes for, 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 for Q&A, if I take into account the, the late uh, start. So um, I'm, I'm going to kick off the, the discussion with, with a couple of questions, and then you know, uh, all of you should feel free to uh, also ask uh, each other um, questions. So I have a question for perhaps David and, and, and Jacqueline on, on, on perhaps the the dynamics, you know, in, in terms of this interaction between the, the pricing mechanism and, and the uh, technology push, you know, R&D grants and, 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 and so on, especially in the current context of, you know, rising uh, energy prices, it seems to me that, okay, both instruments are, are complementary, but um, in terms of the, the timing, you know, the sequencing, it looks like, uh, you know, we should perhaps care of, uh, Care about R and D support, you know, uh, first, and 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 carbon pricing later, uh, and and also in terms of the the social acceptability of these uh, pricing me mechanisms, which we know, you know, is is, is a very difficult uh, business, and and you know now we don't have really the low carbon alternatives, and so we're paying the, the full cost of of this, you know, uh, uh, fossil energy price uh, increase. So. Could you please comment on, on, on this, uh, this dimension, you know, the kind of dynamics in, in terms of what's the, the, the not optimal, but, you know, uh, um, a reasonable way to, to approach this? David first, perhaps, and then I, I'm sure Jacqueline will also have to say some, uh, something to sound this. Sure. Um, well, it's, it's an interesting question, and it's, you know, I think it's, we're, we're kind of past the point of one versus the other, so we think, you know, I, um, I think it was Asimoglu had a, and I can't remember his co-authors had a, a, a list a few years ago looking at, you know, like, do you do R&D subsidies first and then carbon tax and, you know, when, when, do you, when do you switch and so on? Um, you know, and the argument is kind of, you know, use the R&D first, you get the cost down, and then, you know, once you get the cost down, you can move to, to carbon pricing. Um, but we have, you know, that's worked. So, I mean, you know, I mean, we've, you know, the, whatever combination, you know, we've used, you know, we've gotten the cost of wind and solar down to where it's competitive, you know, and so, you know, there's, you know, there's definitely penetration of these. And so we want some sort of carbon pricing or, or cap and trade or whatever to incentivize use of those sorts of things, um, you know, to incentivize energy efficiency, um, energy efficiency industry and so on. The challenge now is that you know, because we know we need a we need a wider portfolio of technologies than what we just have if we're going to get to net zero. So the challenge now is how do you promote that next generation of you know, things that are still further from market, while trying to incentivize the stuff that is in the market. And I think that's where you know these subsidies probably you know that's where subsidies need to be targeted at those things that are still high cost, you know, offshore wind versus onshore wind or, or energy storage. And so I think it's really, you know, we're at the point where you do need to have that, that menu of policies because we're trying to, you know, we're in the middle of the transition now, right? We're trying to encourage the use of the stuff that we've successfully developed, but trying to make sure we don't just stop and just leave us with the technology we have now is what we're going to have, you know, as the menu 20 years from now. Thank you. Too. Yeah, definitely. Um, the super interesting question. And uh, I'm glad David mentioned the Asimoglu paper because that was one of the first things that came to mind here. Um, and I, yeah, I think the finding is that kind of over time, those R&D subsidies can kind of come down. But 
Um, I would completely, I, I think, agree with David on the fact that like we need to think about you know where we're targeting the R and D subsidies here um, on the timing side, and that the demand side policies, so those carbon taxes, are going to continue or hopefully to drive um, kind of the the cost declines and such. And, the, and even at the kind of earlier stage development of technologies, you can think about demand inducing that type of innovation, right? So you kind of, you do need both um, to some extent, but like that targeting kind of those newer breakthrough technologies that have the bigger, you know, spillovers um, seems really important for the the earlier stage stuff. Um, but yeah, that's mostly just a, to echo a lot of what David just said. But what about the, the right balance, you know, between Uh, existing technologies and then further, you know, it's accelerating the diffusion and and uh, pushing for these this breakthrough and you know what kind of uh, instruments do, do we need for those breakthrough? Do we need any specific? And certainly, R and D tax credits are not going to you know drive this. So, um, yeah, I mean that that's actually you know, I think there's. That's the kind of place where, like, you know, the modeling exercise that we, that we just saw can be important to kind of think about what is the value of putting in, you know, whether it's offshore wind or, again, you know, whether it's adding battery storage to the grid. Um, you know, the, th the thing with the Asimoglu paper, you know, is the, you know, the kind of early papers, you know, it's just a distinction between clean and dirty, right? And once you've got the clean technology cheap, you switch over to carbon taxes and you decarbonize right and you know the challenge is that you know you know we don't you know we need more of the modeling efforts to kind of look at the detail of what technologies you know what technologies do we need to bring in um r&d tax credits aren't going to really probably aren't going to do that because you know r&d tax credit is going to you know if you think it's basically going to it's going to still focus on kind of the marginal technology you know what's next on the list of things that firms that firms want to do Um, and so it's really kind of identifying, you know, what is it, you know, is it just, what is it that's keeping the technology out of the market? Is it just high cost, you know, um, in which case, you know, R&D subsidies, you know, early go government investment in R&D and kind of the more basic research is probably, is probably the tool you need. Is it a coordination problem? Um, you know, the work, working with uh, a PhD student looking at innovation and smart grids and looking at the role that standards can play on that because you need communicate, you know, you need, basically you're trying to bring together work in IT and electricity grids and so on, right? And so trying to figure out, you know, why, why is it that these technologies that are still, you know, at the lab stage, you know, what's keeping, what's keeping them, what's keeping them away and then trying to target that specifically. And I think the, the danger in doing that is, you know, we want to, we, do, we want to avoid, you know, we, we, you know, one of the nice things about kind of the market-based policy is it does allow lots of different types Of innovation to occur, so that you know, so we we know we know some things are, are going to fail. So we want to be careful, I think, not to put all the eggs in one basket. You know, you don't you don't want to be going down too much of an industrial policy um, program where you're focusing on specific technologies. Um, you know, but acknowledging that some investments are going to fail, I mean, that's where that early that that's where that early stage R and D is going to be most helpful, I think. Yeah, and just to kind of add to that, I think this distinction between, you know, direct grants and tax credits becomes really important in the context of um, financing constraints, uh, and especially kind of smaller firms or startups that might face these, but they're the ones that potentially are developing a lot of the kind of big breakthrough technologies in the sense that, you know, thinking to um, my R&D subsidy and tax credit results, um, those interactions, and of course, that's not green innovation specifically, but when you see that the, the tax credit enhances the grant effect for the smaller firms, but not for the larger firms, it's kind of uh, essentially implying here that, you know, those smaller firms kind of do need that direct support up front. And then, of course, they can't claim tax credits if they're not able to do additional R&D on top of that. So it's kind of this more enabling effect um, where we don't see that for the larger firms. And then for the other um, kind of early stage results, looking at how carbon pricing and R&D uh, tax credits interact, um, we do find that for some set of firms, for these are manufacturing firms, there is this kind of dampening effect. So as the tax credit rate increases, the effect of carbon taxes actually decreases, um, which is really interesting because from a cross partial perspective, it actually implies that they're substitutes in some way. But I think that the um, kind of 
the we're still trying to understand this result, but one of the potential kind of interpretations of this is that the tax credit just redirects the type of R&D that um, these firms are doing in response to a carbon tax. And so it might move them towards doing more kind of process innovation rather than kind of the big um, breakthrough stuff. So if you think about kind of without that tax credit, maybe they're responding to carbon prices by um, innovating in the, the kind of baseline or the, the earlier stage technology, but the tax credit kind of moves that type of innovation um, in a different direction. So yeah, I do think it's it's important to think about um, the types of innovation that come out of these different instruments. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, I have a question for, for Damien next, but but I guess, you know, uh, David and Jacqueline, and I'm not forgetting the others, I'm, I'm coming to you. Uh, you've worked also on, uh, you have this NVR uh, chapter on, on the role of uh, startups, because you know, Daniel, from your uh, paper, there's this, you know, really long lag, right? Uh, so you measure firm performance by this, this market share, uh, of course, you know, for startups, we, we could, things are a bit different. But, you know, I'm, I'm thinking if, if this radically new innovation, this breakthrough are to come at least partially, you know, partly from, from, from startups, from new firms, this, you know, very long time uh, for, for the, the, the payoff, uh, which is, I think, something that, Jacqueline and David, you also observe in your paper now with, with this uh, crunch based data. Uh, you know, it's not going to, I mean, it's, it's just too long, you know, uh, for, for, for the, this. So, so what, what can we, you know, what, what, do we, what should we do about specifically those, those type of, uh, of firms, you know, that might generate some of those, some of those breakthroughs? Uh, or, you know, are we, le are we learning something for, for this? So the, the paper I presented is mainly on uh, large automotive firms. Yes. So, uh, you know, I cannot extrapolate <laughs> much on the startups. Um, but yeah, how, um, I guess, you know, how to diminish these lags is by trying to, um, you know, facilitate the time it takes for firms, you know, to innovate, to have a new idea and to put them on the market. So any policy that, I, that can influence that uh, would be welcome. And we also uh, found in our data that information to consumer is key. And there are many ways uh, government can act on that. And one of the ways, uh, and this, and, and we've shown that uh, the returns, you know, the economic returns uh, for green innovation and and, and green technology adoption is earlier when it's the case when information is greater. So one way to do this uh, is to government to provide more information. And, and some of this, uh, you know, information is, you know, um, uh, you know, tell uh, consumers that they have access to some of the policy tools and people are not always aware of that. So for instance, many people, uh, uh, you know, in France, we have this bonus malus, this cash for clunker uh, type of, uh, of subsidy. And, and people are not uh, uh, well aware of that, do, does not exactly know how it works and so on. And when you improve the information on how, how this works, you can trigger more adoption, especially given that this uh, system, these policies are now well, you know, much better targeted than they were before. Now, you know, low-income households uh, are receiving a larger bonus, you know, to mitigate some of the impacts. Anna Alberini uh, talked about that in our introduction uh, talk. And so I think that these are some ways of the ways, you know, how policymakers can try to diminish this lag and, and increase uh, green technology adoption. This malice, for those of you who don't know, is... Uh... You know this this bonus value system in France is, is has become quite impressive in terms of the the, the numbers um, because not only now is it you know dependent on income for the the bonuses but also on the malus side so the, the basically the tax you have to pay to acquire a, a carbon emitting vehicle mm -hmm. uh, above two hundred and thirty grams per kilometer which is just you know twice the average of the the fleet uh, for new cars mm -hmm. in Europe the the tax is 40,000 euros per car, per new car. So it's, uh, 
it starts to 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 bite. I think at, at this level. Uh, Jacqueline, David, did, did you want to add something on the uh, entrepreneurs, uh, startups side of things? Uh, I could. I don't know. David, if you wanted to jump in, I, I, there are just two things that kind of came to mind. Um, this, yeah, really trying to think about this this timeline thing is a uh, is challenging. Um, and so, one thing that I, I don't know if it's been explored in the literature yet. I don't think so. But I'd be really curious about like um, whether there's some role for kind of the the type of collaborations that could occur or be encouraged um, across the different types of kind of organizations that are innovating. So, what I have in mind here is say academic researchers collaborating with those at like a national lab and thinking about kind of complementary assets essentially. So if a, you know, academics are starting to develop a technology, they don't have access to say um, a lot of the kind of big machinery that's required to then like kind of test and demonstrate their technologies a bit more. And, um, and then eventually then hopefully drive down, like get to market a little bit faster. Um, there's also some like strategic kind of partnerships, I think um, is what they've been called out there that also then connect those firms to, to kind of the financing as well for, um, and especially kind of bigger finances, financers rather than uh, VCs. Um, so yeah, so I'd be really curious if there's a role for encouraging those collaborations and um, what the effects are. And then I, I think another is just the combination of kind of early stage grants along with um, kind of diffusion oriented grant grants. So there's evidence um, from the California Solar Initiative, which was one of the, I think the biggest kind of um, upfront subsidy program out there for solar adoption. And there's a lot of, um, there's evidence out there that a lot of the kind of cost declines and, and uptake was driven by by that subsidy program. So those were two things that that came to mind there. Yeah, the only thing I'll add, I, I, I apologize that I, I was trying to listen to the answers, but, um, but also looking at some of the typing and answer to one of the questions online. But I think it's actually kind of relates to one of the things was online because it gets at the again goes back to the question of the timing and policy. And I would say you know the, the v, you know one thing that, you know, is the VC stuff is typically going to be things that are that, that, that at some level are close to market. I mean you know, you know the, one of the advantages of the, of the VC is you know you know that these small firms can often bring new ideas and things that might look like breakthroughs. Um, but it still has to be something where, you know, the costs are low enough that there's going to be, either the costs are low enough or the policy support high enough that there's going to be, that there's going to be demand for it. You know, so the, the demand, you know, the demand still is a, demand still is a big driving factor because at the end of the day for these firms, you know, success is, you know, success is an exit to success is being bought out or somehow getting their, their product to market. Um, so I think it's a good example. I mean, it's a good example of, you know, I'm just, I'm trying to connect it into this question was online and kind of thinking about how the for each of these technologies, the time, the timing, the timing changes. Um, you know, so solar went from, you know, can I so, you know, basic research that was developed by NASA, you know, for in the 60s and 70s for the space program, developing photovoltaic cells. And then, you know, there was developments in Japan in the 80s and 90s. And then the German feed-in tariffs came in and production moved to China. And you kind of see it moving from more basic to more applied as the technology evolves. And you know, and I put in the answer, in the, in, in the answer in the Q&A, Greg Nemeth at University of Wisconsin has a great book and look, looking at the history of solar. I think yeah, I'd encourage people to take a look at that. Cause it's really, you know, it's, it's, you know, for each technology you're looking at, kind of figuring out, well, which stage is this technology at? And, you know, picking the right tool for that particular, you know, for whatever stage, whatever stage that technology is in. I can also uh, highly recommend uh, Greg's book. Okay. Uh, it's, it's really excellent. Okay, I was about to ask a question to Junje, but uh, Damien is telling me in the chat, he also has one. So, uh, give you- yes. uh, Thank you, Antoine. Yeah, I wanted to ask um, Junje the following. I see in your conclusion that you, you, you found that innovation offsets the cost of compliance. And I wanted to, to ask you uh, whether this is only true for firms that innovated a lot more in green innovation in the past. That's the first question. And then the second question is more of a technical question. Uh, when you talk about a, a one year, two year and three year windows, uh, is it the lag between when the uh, ETS was introduced or is it the lag when the innovation occurred? Um, so the uh, e innovation, we, we uh, think about the stock of patents uh, accumulated before the ETS. 
so the lag is indeed uh, the the initiation of the ETS or one year, uh, two year uh, into. So we see that in the first uh, in in the first period, indeed, there's a, a big difference uh, for ETS and non-ETF firms, but the difference actually fade out. Uh, I, I think the other firms they catch up gradually. Yeah. Can I add, uh, ask another question to you, Junji? Because um, as I said, you know, after your talk, there, there's there's been quite uh, some work on the European carbon market, which started, you know, earlier in, in 2005, and the same questions have basically been looked at in that case. So, was wondering if you had compared the results that you get with those, you know, obtained in that literature, focusing on on the ETS in in Europe, and 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 whether there are anything to to learn, you know, perhaps on the, on the design of, you know, carbon market and in, in, in their, you know, uh, the impact that they might have on, on innovation, but also on firm performance. We compared our estimates well with the results from the European market. We found that the magnitude are quite similar, uh, this surprisingly. Um, and also, I think the, uh, the conclusion are also similar, uh, that the, the from zero to one is a huge change. So this is, uh, although the carbon price can be low, uh, but this sends a very strong signal to the firms. Uh, they think this is something, this is a, a regime shifting. Uh, they need to be serious because this once it's a start, it's the, it, it will not stop. So I, I think that when we uh, recently in the past two years, we have been interviewing uh, firms uh, in many industries, we have seminars, we have interviews, uh, found that these firms, they actually indeed, they think, okay, this time is different. I mean, at least for China, this time is different. We need to be very serious. And now it's the, we, we can't just use transitory uh, actions to deal with the climate change problems. So this is, I, I think this is the, the conclusion uh, is very similar uh, with the EU ETS. So it's the, yeah, so it's, it's really interesting because what matters, I mean, obviously for innovation, what matters is not the, the price today, it's the, the expected future price, right? And, yeah. uh, and so apparently it doesn't really matter what the spot price is on the ETS or the Chinese market. It's, it's really the fact that you're in and that there is now certainty that, you know, uh, you'll be in for, for a long time and that the prices is, you know, are going to, to, to rise. And that's what, you know, starts the, the, the innovation incentive in, in a sense. Is there any work on this? I mean, all of you, uh, in terms of trying to get that, you know, future expected prices instead of what we've been using for, for decades. And I know, David, you, you try to do this in, in your seminar paper, you know, with this adaptive expectation model, for example, but obviously that cannot, you know, predict prices, you know, that really go uh, much higher than what they have been in the past. So, um, you know, you know, again, the current context for that you know, is, is, is interesting. You know, will, will people, firms think that prices will eventually go down or, you know, if, if they think they, they remain at this level, it could have a, massive impact on, on, on this, you know, energy efficiency innovation, I suppose. Anyone? I mean, yeah, Anton, I agree, but is there any, you know, the only way to recover, you know, how people anticipate prices would be to have survey data. And I wondered if this exists at all or not. I don't know if any one of you had, you know, know anything about this kind of uh, survey. So and one, not, uh, one, yeah, sorry, David. Well, I was going to say I, I'm not aware of any survey, but I'm thinking about you know there, there's the 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 European innovation survey that's that's given out every couple of years, and it seems like that might be. I have no idea how much influence people the OECD have on those types of things, but that might be a good question to ask. I know they have an environmental module, so thinking about you know what firms think of expectations, actually, that might be, that would be the place to do it. I think. Um, one, one empirical challenge uh, using the expected price is that uh, for carbon market in, in whatever country is actually a complementary policy. Well, yeah, so there are so many other policies uh, existing. Uh, the carbon price in the ETS does not necessarily uh, reflect the marginal abatement cost. This is just a residual 
uh, the the modular abatement cost for the resi residual emissions. So in this case, I, I I'm afraid that we we need to use the the overall a uh, a uh, broad picture to measure both implicit and explicit uh, carbon pricing. Yeah, on that and to like I yeah I I would agree. Um, that makes a lot of sense and. Um, one thing that, so I, I don't know how helpful this is going to be because now I'm blanking on the, the authors, but I could have sworn I did come across a paper that was starting to think about expectations and at least um, kind of on the policy uncertainty side of things. Um, but I, yeah, I am blanking on on who those the authors were. Um, but another thought, um, so I think, yeah, it makes sense to kind of think about measuring this in a survey kind of context. Um, another thing that came to mind, I guess, if anybody's looking for a research project is to start um, scraping kind of news news articles and such to try to get a proxy for policy uncertainty and potential expectations. Um, just if, if there's a lot of things in the news about future kind of policy or carbon pricing, maybe that's that's some reasonable proxy as well. I think Ralph, Martin, and Mirabel Mules, they, they asked this question in one of the surveys they conducted like 10 years ago. Uh, it was a cross-section though, uh, but uh, jo jo Joelle Noali um, and, so, and some of her co-authors, um, it, it was part of the innov innovation workshop we did at NBR. They, they did a paper looking, looking at newspaper data to try to get expectations. But, you know, it's, again, I think you know, the thing with that is, you know, that's still, it's short-term expectations is not that much different than what you're using by looking at kind of a history of prices. And I think part of what Antoine's getting at is, you know, how do we think about expectations for 10, 15 years in the future? And, you know, that, that's a little more. That's more challenging. Yeah. Uh, Yuko, we, we haven't asked you any question. Uh, do, do you want to perhaps tell us a bit more about the uh, innovation policies in, in Japan, uh, which are in place to drive this, or perhaps it's not your your area in, 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 you know, because you're doing the, the modeling work and you're not uh, working on the, on the policy side? But uh, do you know, do you have any idea of what you know what are Japan's plans uh, in terms of um, innovation policies to you know uh, get the deployment of all these technologies you, you showed us as so important across the, the board? Mm. <laughs> it might not be your your field of expertise. No, I'm, I don't mm. want to put you on the spot here. Um. I'm I'm sorry, I cannot hear you because some some noisy, <laughs> a little bit noisy. So please give. Okay. Uh, okay. No, I was asking you about uh, mm. policies, innovation mm. policies in in mm. Japan, Japan, or you know the climate policy mm. um, landscape. You know, not only innovation policy but also mm. uh, you know energy carbon pricing in in Japan to drive this. This massive, you know, structural transformation that you, you showed us is, is necessary to get to to net zero in 2050. Hmm. Yes, of course. Japanese, uh, Japanese government think the uh to uh carbon tax policy or other uh, cross sectional policy are needed. They think, and they uh try to uh discuss. But uh, uh, um, it is difficult to uh, eh, to do uh, to eh, to start the uh, the carbon tax uh, at the level of uh, some uh, how to say uh, the level some uh, give us uh, some impact to uh, to uh, achieve the new uh, low carbon society yeah, yeah. now mm. yeah well I, I guess perhaps with the the recent surge in energy prices we we have the carbon tax we, we always uh, dreamt of uh, don't don't need to uh, to impose it but uh, although I guess I mean for this management of expectations, you know, it would still matter to to make it clear that you know if prices would go down, they would now be uh, uh, compensated by by some form of, of carbon pricing to to you know make sure that expectations are 
uh, modified, uh, as, you know, following on what we just said. Uh, listen, it's we're, we're almost 20 minutes uh, over time, so I think uh, my job is now to uh, close this session uh, and thank you all very, very much for participating. Uh, especially Jacqueline, I think you had to wake up very early for us, so much appreciated. Uh, uh, so thank you, uh, all of you, for the, the great presentation and the interesting discussion. Uh, you can also, uh, you're very welcome to attend tomorrow's uh, sessions uh, as well. Perhaps, Nicolina, you can remind us what they are about, and I'm going to close my mic and, uh, and shut up. Thanks again. Thank you very much, Antoine. I hope you're hearing me okay. Um, usually when we organize these kind of workshops, we try to anticipate all kinds of surprises. Um, but we hadn't planned for an evacuation of the office in the middle of the session. So bear with me in terms of the background noise. We had to quickly find a, a new venue. Um, so let me just keep this very brief. Uh, just want to thank all the speakers and the moderators uh, that took the time today to, to join us and, and to prepare uh, for today's intervention, making for an um, excellent discussion. It's been interesting to hear these different types of perspective, both from a kind of a broad, high level overview and, and to now focus on, on the role of innovation. As um, Antoine mentioned, we'll continue tomorrow uh, when we'll be focusing on the implication of environmental policies on employment and, and broader social and distributional outcomes. So I hope you, um, as many of you, will be able to join us tomorrow um, as we continue this discussion. I'm not going to try and, and wrap up uh, it kind of uh, summarize today's discussion, but uh, simply to say that um, uh, the recording um, of this first part of the workshop will be made available online shortly and then um, hope to see you tomorrow. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you Thanks for organizing. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.